Greetings and salutations, everyone. Welcome to yet another episode of the Snarp Fangle Podcast. I'm your host. Yeah, I'm just bottom me. I am your host, Jake Metzger. I don't know what just happened there. And uh, along with my co-host, wonderful man, you might know him as, by the name of David Reed. <clears throat> David, how are you? Uh, how are you faring on this fine summer's day? I am faring quite well, in fact, mm. excellently. One might say. He feels good, ladies and gentlemen, and I hope you do too, because well, on the Snart Fangle podcast, for those unaware, Snart Fangle is our conversational podcast we do each and every week, where we bring a topic of discussion to you, the wonderful congregation of those listening today. We are honored to have your attention and time, and we, while well, we proceed to talk about what today's topic entails. David, what is our topic today? So, <clears throat> today... Our topic is another, the second installment in our exciting two-film series. Oh! The two films we have for you today, Click and Colossal. Mm, and with these two films, ladies and gentlemen, the theme for these films is tonal shift. Now, David, before we dive into the explanation of tonal shift, I just want to apologize about something and kind of give you a backhanded compliment. Are you ready? Oh, yeah. Well, you see, I want to apologize for my generation, the Gen Zers out there, because you see, David, they are becoming more and more part of the limelight and the, the focus light of today's current world discussion points. And they're starting to say that stuff from the early 2000s is, is nostalgic now, <clears throat> which I beg to differ. Let's, let's not get ahead of ourselves. Let's hold your horses, ladies and gentlemen. Let's come on. Let's not, let's not go all the way there. Come on, just chill out, all right? My nephew says, oh, wow, I'm really nostalgic for Geometry Dash, which I played back in 2012 when I was like four. And I'm like, <laughs> son, I agree. There's nostalgic in pretty much every aspect, and it's a heck of a drug. But let's keep it isolated to Geometry Dash and, and to the small portions and the, of the internet, you know? It's not supposed to be the main focal point. I don't want to go in and see that... Um, TriStar has the rights to a Dragon Booster movie. I don't want to see that right now. That's another 10 years away. Pray to God that's the case. Uh, maybe maybe me and Baron Trumple will chill out with that. So anyway, I just want to apologize, David, that they're becoming more of the talking points. I mean, 10 years ago, it was all about the 90s, and now it's starting to leak into the 2000s. Maybe they'll finally discover <laughs> Stay like we did last time on this episode. Who knows? You know, everything old is new again. Exactly. But, and yeah, technically it is old. And I think in terms of what's it called? Retro, I guess, 20 years. Oh, yeah. Is considered retro. Yeah. I, uh, I remember seeing a uh, YouTube video a while back that it was, they up, someone uploaded a, um, a Morbid Angel concert from 1989. Now, for those unaware, Morbid Angel is a death metal band. Ooh. Like, gurgly, growly vocals and satanic imagery in there. Oh, kind of like this podcast. Album artwork, yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, yeah, so someone <laughs> uploaded, uh, like, one of their concerts they put on, like, DVD from, like, 1989. Mm. Uh, just so happens to be the year I was born. Um, anyway... I believe the, if I remember correctly, the YouTube video itself had been uploaded in 2009, and the description said, wow, this is 20 years old. Can this be considered classic rock now? <laughs> <laughs> um, what were the comments? Um, I don't think any of them addressed the, the uh, description of the video. I think they were mostly about, yeah, I'm Orbit Angel. But, uh, you know... <laughs> I mean, I'd be hyped, too, if I found their concert online. That'd be kind of dope. And what's with the deal with people? I see people at the concerts, you know, and they're recording with their phones. Everybody's got a phone. They're recording it, David. And they don't flip and post it anywhere online. It's like on their story, and it's gone forever. Stop being selfish, guys, like yeah. me, and holding it on your Put phone's Put it battery. on archive.org. Yeah, come on. There's a reason why that, that website goes around... Uh, uh, what's it called? Copyright law? That's the point of it, you know? <laughs> so, but speaking of copyright law and shifting the tones of, uh, well, shifting tones, I guess. 
David, what uh, what we've picked two films, Click and Colossal. And would you mind explaining to me why we chose these two films and what does tonal shift entail? Well, I think it all started having a conversation about the movie Click. I had uh, mentioned that it was a very strange movie in that it was billed as a comedy, started off as a comedy, and by the end of it, had turned into something altogether more depressing than you would expect from an Adam Sandler comedy. Mm. And so I think from there we just was like, we got to find another movie like this and (laughs) add it to our two film series. And it took a while. Yeah, it took a little bit. And I don't think we hit the same kind of tonal shift. Mm. but it's but we did hit it yeah we did hit it yeah i mean we were thinking about it and thinking about it trying to find movies going through our library going through streaming stuff and we just couldn't find a good example of a tonal shift to go along with click it's very much its own unicorn out in the op- out in the wild kind of like adam sandler he's his own unicorn out in the wild you know it's he's just nobody like adam a unicorn if you will a unicorn if you will um and so it was kind of tough, but we actually finally found something. Somebody online said Colossal, and we're like, what the heck's Colossal? And you will find out soon enough. But let's dive into Click, David. I'm excited to I'm excited to talk about this movie today. I remember you suggested it, and I'm like, oh, God, it's Adam Sandler. But okay, I'll, I'll give it a chance. I love Happy Gilmore, but his later stuff is, at least for me, very questionable. And you know what? I, I, I got to say, I was... Um, I was pleasantly disappointed in this movie in nearly every facet, except I did laugh through the entire movie, even though my face and demeanor the entire time was of a, a father, a disappointed father throughout this entire movie. But I did laugh. So it's like, you know, me, me and, you know, my, 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 my future son, I'll say to him, you know what, kid, you're making those uh, TikTok edits and I really appreciate you. And, and I love how you do it on old games like, Paper Mario, which I guess is old right now, but you know what? Even though I think you should do it to other things, I'm proud of you, son. So I wasn't proud of this movie, like my future son, but I was very disappointed in this uh, in the viewing of this film. But uh, let's just dive right into it, David. Um, I kind of want to talk about your. This is a bit. That was my first. <laughs> that's my first reaction to Click <laughs> when we watched it the other night, and. Um, when did you first watch this movie? Did you go and see it in theaters? I did not go and see it in theaters. What? No, um, no way. But if I recall, I mm. did watch it shortly after it came out. Um, I guess we must have uh, rented it from some kind of some kind of blockbuster esque establishment, mm. you know, as such things don't exist in the day, but they were. Everywhere when I was a child. Mm-hmm. Well, in fact, it's kind of uh, not- notoriety that you. It's kind of notable that you bring that up because I think Redbox just announced they're going bankrupt. And oh yeah, I heard about that. Shutting down as of this recording. So. The last bastion of DVDs <laughs> in the modern world. Uh, there's other places you can go, but yes, that and Best Buy are kind of. Re- and Target, I believe, as well, is starting to revert away from physical media. But that's a discussion for another day. Um, so, yeah, you guys rented it. You had a good time, I'm assuming. Um, Enjoyed it? I would imagine so. Yeah. I mean... There's, it's an enjoyable film, I would say. Yeah. I, I mostly... I have to say I was kind of surprised when we watched it again because... You watched it a second time? Oh my god! No, no when we watched it. Oh, when you. Oh, oh. Okay, when we gotcha. watched it, we I watched was surprised it. because um, the tonal shift definitely occupied the, my uh, memory of the film, and my memory of the other aspects of the film were a little less mm. specific. So certain parts of it was like, "Whoa, that's weird. This is different than I remember." Yeah, it was um, it was quite an interesting movie. It was, in fact, it was directed here by Frank Karachi or Karachi, 
who went on to direct lots of Adam Sandler movies and and, and still works today. We got Adam Sandler. You got his wife, who's played by Kate Beckinsale, of all people. You got, you know, Mrs. Underworld in there. And Christopher Walken and some more names as we as we go along through the movie. Um, but I kind of want to talk about just really briefly the budget. I was very surprised this movie had a budget of $82.5 million, which seems a little low or high, I guess. I guess it's, I would say high. Um, but there's a flipping lot of, as we'll get into, a lot of product placement in this movie. Like an obscene amount of product placement. In fact, it's it's basically part of the plot. Well, ne- yeah, it was part of the plot, I would say, in some aspects. Not really. Anyway, it's uh yeah. Yeah, there there is kind it's, of it's uh, egregiously. Yeah, there is so. kind of a uh a the, weird element where a brand plays a role in how the plot develops, which I thought was interesting. But, you know, it's Adam Sandler. What do you expect? Yeah, yeah, and it's it's just it's just so weird. All right, let's dive into it. So you get into the movie. It opens up with that wonderful song Magic by the Cars. You're like, okay, what are we getting into? This is a, this is an interesting film. You're, you know, what's he's a dad? Okay, he's sleeping. His kids wake him up. Oh no, those darn kids are waking him up again. Oh man! And then like, as we go through this opening, it's kind of like, man, this guy's a loser. What's going on, man? This guy is like, you have no sympathy for him. You, you. <laughs> I don't know. I was, I remember watching it with you, and I was like, man, this guy's like a just a. Like, I don't feel bad for this guy at all. Like, he is, and some moments later on I do, but, man, this guy is, like, kind of deserves what's coming to him, you know, with his inability to kind of deal with life in general, you know? I get it. You know, being a family man and all this stuff is, you know, can be hard at times. I understand that, and it's frustrating. But it's like, dude, just, just like, what? Like, what are you doing? What do, what do you, oh, man, I don't know, David. What do you think about <laughs> yeah, Adam Sandler's. Movie. I don't know what the intention was, but yeah, Adam Sandler doesn't play a very likable character. Yeah, he's <laughs> he's honestly a jackass. Yeah, he's a total jackass. It's like, <laughs> and it's like you're supposed to be sympathetic for him. I think. I, I guess so. But maybe I don't know. Maybe Sandler was going for some sort of weird ironic thing. Because this is late period Sandler, yeah, so period. it's starting to get in the late period Sandler. Yeah, so he could have he could have had some weird ideas about making like an unsympathetic main character just for the heck of it or something. I don't know. Yeah, and and I you know the only thing I've probably seen from Adam Sandler I've seen Bedtime Stories, which is an atrocious movie. Don't watch it. Um, but and he doesn't play the same character. He's way more sympathetic in that film. He's way like a like a, a dad you actually care for in that film, from what I remember. Um, you have all the same staples in every single one of the films. Films I remember seeing parts of The Longest Yard, which I think came out after this. I could be wrong on that. I, I think don't that was 07. Know. But anyway, this is 06. And oh, in fact, it made 240 million worldwide, which is crazy. It made a lot. These these Adam Sandler films, they make money, man. And they're in theaters forever. So it's like, honey, what you remember when we went on a date night like four months ago to go see Click? Yeah. It's still in theaters. Oh my God, let's go see it again. Cause it's in theaters forever. Like it just <laughs> never never leaves. Um, but anyway, you get it, you, you get you see him with his family and the dog, and this dog is a, a very question a sexually questionable dog, as well as we uh, you know, he likes to it's it's very bizarre. There's so many aspects to this film that are just I okay, first off, let me just say. The directing, cinematography, editing, all great. Like there's nothing wrong with any aspect of that. They're all fine, they all work. In fact, there's very interesting use of Dutch angles, which I find interesting. And I don't um I don't get the purpose of them at some points, but I see that there's talent behind the camera, is what I'm saying. There's talent in the whole production. It's just the Adam Sandler ism and the factor of him is what concerns me with this film. Yeah, they're just certain gags are in there, and you're just like, why is this in there? And, like, yeah. like with the dog. I mean, it's you know, it's not much of a spoiler because like what it happens <laughs> in the first five minutes of the movie. <laughs> spoiler. 
He he humps a stuffed duck. Yeah, a stuffed and, uh, animal duck, which is huge. And he, um, <laughs> yeah, he does this throughout the movie. Yeah, and then they they build on that gag in weird ways. It, oddly enough, creative ways, I will say. Like, um, I'll give it to now, it's. Man. But very questionable for sure. Yeah, I just I it's one of those things where it's like <laughs> why is this you put here? this in here and then not only did you put it in here, but you made it like a running joke that you built other jokes on top of. Mm. And it's like the whole structure is very questionable. Yeah, and it's just like I feel like if this was, was written by anybody else or, or or say another comedian, I feel like it would have hit more in terms of authenticity in terms of jokes. However, the Adam Sandler factor is an Adam Sandler factor, and that's undeniable. This film would not be successful in this concept without Adam Sandler, I think. It's also a really interesting concept. I mean, it's basically, as far as we know, it's basically a Twilight Zone episode all through and through. This guy finds this device which changes his life but ends up benefiting his negative aspects and is a tragedy in the end. You know, that's basically what it is. And that's why I love how the tonal shift as we go through the film, which we're going to get to eventually, it it really does... You see it coming from a mile away, but when it does hit, it is effective. And it does a really good job at that, I think. Yeah. Even with all the Adam Sandler-isms and the factor of him. Yeah, that's the thing about the tonal shift in this movie is it's not a surprise by any stretch of the imagination because... He's a jackass from the beginning. <laughs> yes. So when things finally go down mm. later on in the film, you're like, oh, this is what this, was coming. Yeah. But at the same time, the way it's shot, the way it's acted, the way it's portrayed, mm. it like really hits you. Just like, whoa. Yeah. This is not a comedy anymore. No. And it, and that's what I love about um, this film, which I. I probably won't ever see again. Like I love Happy Gilmore. I'll probably watch that a million times. Like it's infinitely rewatchable. This one I just can't really stand. Really, you know, disappointing dad face. You know, that's that's just how I feel with this film. But what I will say is that this movie it does a great job at executing well, and it has um, you can tell like they were what they were striving for. They achieved, and they achieved it in nearly every aspect. And there's actual character development in this character. Surprisingly. After looking at this character for like ninety whole minutes, and you're like, "What's happening, dude? Like, just, just, it's so easy. Just be nice to your children and your wife. That's all you got to do. Why do you want to climb the corporate ladder and go from it?" So I'm going to go to my notes here, David, and we'll kind of just uh, we'll go through it and see what you got. My first thing I wrote down was Dragon Tales on the TV. Speaking of Gen Z nostalgia, um. So, yeah, I wrote down that down. And then I wrote down a quote, I think, from the neighbor kid as he's exiting the house that morning. It says, what kind of stereo you got in that blue piece of shit? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, that's another This kid, dude. This kid. A terrible kid. Is like his, like, alpha, like, competition in his neighborhood or something? I guess. I don't know. (laughs) I mean, it's. Which is hilarious. It's the only thing, I think it's the only thing that makes Adam Sandler's character tolerable is that as much of a jackass as he is, there's (laughs) There's other other way way bigger bigger jackasses. jackasses (laughs) And when Adam Sandler manages to dunk on them, it is satisfying. It is so incredibly satisfying. And he has that in every aspect of his film um, with every like... Every kind of like archetype he falls up, he comes up against. It's that's something I've noticed about his films. He'll always get the better in the end, but maybe that's because it's an Adam Sandler movie. Yeah, that is know. that's just an Adam Sandler I think thing. It's just a, a, a he, he's always word? trying to he's always trying to play this this sort of unassuming normal dude who just <laughs> manages to dunk on all the a holes in his life. You know. <laughs> yeah, and. Uh, and it's, you know, they're, they're basically all heroes' journeys in their own way. Um, but let's continue on here. Adam is our miserable white dad archetype who hates his family. And then I wrote down, the Hoff is in this film? So yeah, he goes to the office, and uh, David Hasselhoff is randomly in this film for quite a bit. I was very surprised. Yeah, he's 
uh, Adam Sandler's boss through most of the movie. <laughs> and he's one of the ones who's like a much bigger asshole much bigger than Adam Sandler. Animal. Yeah. So it's... <laughs> Which is really funny because at uh, David Hasselhoff is like, he does it so well. Oh man, he's so great! Like you just hate him. You hate him, but you but you love it. You yeah. love to hate him. You love to hate him, and and, and and yeah, it's just he's great. He's so good in this role. Um, after that, we have a meaning of a bunch of I want to say businessmen from India. And they not all, India, not India. Oh no, it was a. Uh, um, what was it? It was um. I I believe it was Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia, and I was looking at the. There's a bunch of them at the this at the table there, and David Hasselhoff and Adam Sandler comes in, and they're talking to him, and I was looking at the main guy, David, and I'm like, why does his face look so familiar? <laughs> what? Why? Why? Where have I seen this man in? And then I re- no. Then I finally realized. I'm like. Oh, this is a guy dressed as a Saudi Arabian man. It's Rob Schneider. And it's Rob Schneider. And it's like, man, if Adam Sandler could give him any, every opportunity to get canceled throughout his career, Adam Sandler has handed it over to him with a bountiful plate of food alongside of it. Yes, Rob Schneider playing the uh, <laughs> wonderful character of Prince Habibu. Habibu. <laughs> oh, man. And so, yeah, Rob, Sch- uh, Rob Schneider, man, he's just, Adam, Sandler just keeps putting him in the situations, man. And, I like Rob Schneider. He's a great guy, but I just think it's funny that <laughs> he's always down for these kind of stuff. So, uh, and then uh, what else do I got here? Another failed dad who disappoints his family type of movie. Uh, it takes place on the Fourth of July, and because we were watching around then, and then Sean Astin randomly makes an appearance. Uh, the first appearance in this film. He's and he's wearing a speedo, which was very disturbing. Um. I was not expecting to see that, and I didn't want to see that, and I didn't need to see that, but I saw it. So and if you not only see, do you see it, you see it multiple you times. See, <laughs> you see it multiple. It's one of the running gags that is very much you hold your head in dismay, and then you continue to hold your head in dismay as it goes along. So, And then just, God, there is so much product placement in this movie. Like... It's the ho hos, the Twinkies. Like, that's one thing. He's driving the car at night. He's eating Wendy's. He's passing by businesses. And then, which comes to our main plot point of the film, the first big change in the film, where it's Bed, Bath, and Beyond. Yeah. And they say it multiple times and really emphasize it. And you're like, oh my God, what is happening? And it doesn't make any sense either, too. No. It's like he's shop in this, at this point in the movie. He apparently thinks that he needs a universal remote yes, for all his devices. Because that'll fix everything. Because that'll just, you know, make his life so much easier, I guess. Mm. Um, so he goes shopping late at night for a universal remote. It's like 11 o'clock at night. Yeah, all the stores are closed except Bed Bath & Beyond. And he somehow <laughs> thinks that he's going to find a universal remote in Bed Bath & Beyond. <laughs> So he goes into Bed Bath and Beyond. He talks to some random guy who seems like he works there, and he doesn't work there. Oh shoot, you don't work here. Oh wow, this is a funny bit. I'm gonna go along. He's like, "Oh my god, I love sleep," and he just flops onto this bed randomly, and he's like, "Oh my god, I could sleep here. I'm so tired." And then he opens his eyes, and he sees a door, and it says on it, "Beyond." Well, or no, not beyond. It it, it sets it up too because he wakes up. Okay, he's like, okay, I gotta find this universal remote, and he's so he's like half asleep, walking down past the aisles. He's like, bed, bath, and then he comes to a door, and that catches his eyes like beyond. <laughs> it's the weirdest thing. It's like so blatantly obvious that it's like it's the kind of humor and product placement that makes you angry. But that's kind of its goal. It's to make you like it's so obscene. It's so offensive that it, it's hilarious. I would say. I think that's how I would describe it. But it's like, oh, it's it's overdone. But I'm not going to fall into their trap. I it's it it is hilarious. So anyway, um, let's see. Uh, I wrote down. I forgot how much I dislike Adam Sandler movies. They have the same jokes in every in every single one. Maybe I'm just not used to it. And then we get to the door. 
And he goes through the door, David, and uh, what? What? who does he meet, David, through the door? He meets a certain actor. Oh, he meets a certain actor. Mm. One you might not expect, none other than the esteemed Christopher Walken. Christopher Walken. He meets the Walkman. And the Walkman is uh, fidgeting around and gadgeting and gizmoing around some devices. Of yes, them. he's clearly an employee of this Bed Bath & Beyond, yeah. working in a back room on weird gadgets that he's disassembling and tinkering around with. As you know, every Bed Bath & Beyond has, you know, behind the uh, storefront. <laughs> So um, our character, Michael Newman, played by Adam Sandler, talks to Christopher Walken, whose character's named Morty. And he goes ahead and he discusses. He's like, I need, I need, I need a remote. I need, I need your help here. I need some remotes here. And then uh, Christopher Walken's like, I got it for you. Here you go. But follow me through this door. And what's the door say? It's like. It says way beyond. Way beyond. <laughs> and then they enter this like warehouse facility that is basically the warehouse from Raiders of the Lost Ark. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> There's all they're going through and it's like the CGI of them like walking through and the views from way back here and it's it's pretty it's pretty pretty funny. So, they finally get to these shelves and he looks up at the top middle shelf and he's like, "Is that it over there?" And Marty is looking through the bottom shelf. He's like, "There's well, obviously nothing here." And he's like, "Is that over that top shelf over there?" And Christopher Walken continues to go. He's like, oh, let me get a step stool. And he puts the step stool. Let me just say, and one of the weirdest positions I've seen, I get why you need to put it like this, but it just threw me off. And I'm like, dude, just just use the step stool normally. But at this point, I'm nitpicking, so I'm not going to Yeah, this the ga- the whole gag with the like, <laughs> the like, oh, where, where, where is it? Where is it? And Adam Sandler's like, it's over there. And... <laughs> Christopher Walken's still looking around on the bottom shelf that clearly has nothing on it. It's like, what? Who, who thought of who this thought gag? Of this? And why is they why why does it feel like, oh, we'll put this in here because kids will think it's funny? No, kids are gonna think it's funny. That's not no. Oh, yeah, I wanna know who what that the, what I, who that gag was for. Yeah, and I wanna know what the what the thought of this movie was like, was this greenlit based off of the merits of Adam Sandler, the popularity of Adam Sandler? Or all the all 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 together, or was it greenlit because of how smart it is, David, and how beautiful it is for? Because here's the thing, I'll say it now: our society would be a worse society without this movie. <laughs> I'm gonna say this now. You will see it later as we spoil the ending. But right now, I will say to you that this society would be worse off without Click. <laughs> kind of like the society would be worse off with John Cena. Like sometimes you can't stand the man, but we need him. Just like Adam Sandler, we need the man. <laughs> sometimes sometimes we don't deserve him. Sometimes we do. That's just part of life. So anyway, they find the clicker, David. The universal remote. Mm-hmm. What this whole movie's based off, uh, named after. And this is the remote. And Morty doesn't really give him any instructions. No guidance. He just says, stick it on. I'm Christopher Walken. Yeah, he basically tells him, you know, it's, uh, it's the newest in technology. It's, uh, mm. you know... It's a learn. It learns based on your behavior. You just point and click, <laughs> kind of a thing that like kind of like your cell phone is not you know in any way could be considered like useful instructions. No, but and that's that's part of the thing too that really is weird about this movie is like Adam Sandler finds all these different uses for this remote. It has zero prompting from Morty on that he can do these things with the remote. (laughs) And it's just like, how, why did he decide to point the remote at that in particular at that point and just like, you know, click some buttons on it? And he's like, oh crap, (laughs) this happens. Oh my God, I'd have Sandler. So, um, Again, this dude, Adam Sandler, is such an amazing loser. I don't think I've ever seen a loser out loser than this this guy like anything else, except for when we get to Colossal. We'll talk about that. But, yes, this man is a true and total loser. And it just, I I don't know. I'm getting into the issue right now. But, again, I wrote down lots of weird Dutch angles are being used. 
The scene in the car with him changing colors is just amazing, but I'm getting a little ahead of myself. So he gets home. He does he use the remote or does he wait till the morning? I don't remember. Um or does he get the remote and then he uses it on his wife? Or is that later? Yeah, I don't remember. I honestly don't remember at all. Okay. <laughs> I remember he gets the remote. Yeah, he gets the remote. He, he figures takes it out. Home. Oh shoot! I could fast forward to stuff. I could push. I could turn down the volume. I can. <laughs> is it his sister in law or is it just his oh, wife's friend? Oh, that's what it was. That's that, oh, what okay, it was. That, okay, no, next morning it was the volume. It was the, the volume. volume. So okay, he so comes home. The dog. The dog. The barking. dog's barking ah, at him. Yes, yes. And he's mad at the dog for barking. Um, and it's like, dude, the dog wants to go potty. That's why he's barking at you. It's one in the morning. He's, Let yeah. the dog out. So he's <laughs> mad at the dog for barking. And apparently <laughs> his instinct, because of his anger at the dog, <laughs> is to point the remote at the dog yes. and tap on the volume button. Uh, second nature. Uh, yeah, because everybody knows that, you know, when someone's being too loud and you want them to shut up, you uh, point your imaginary remote control <laughs> at them and click... Click furiously. Click furiously. And he finds out that, well, the dog's barking goes away mm. as he pushes the volume button down. And then the realization hits him, and he's, we see his face, and it zooms on, and he's like, wow, oh my god. And then he, he then lets the dog out, proceeds to do that, and then he fast-forwards the dog. Yeah, the dog is, like, taking too long. To go to the bathroom. <laughs> God, and a, just, just do it. Just go potty. And again. Go to the bathroom. And again. Do your business. His instinct <laughs> is somehow. Somehow. To point the remote at the dog and hit fast forward. Because, that, you know. Because that's what you do. That's what you do. I know I do that with my dog. And the dog, you know, goes potty in. <laughs> You know, at like three or four times speed, <laughs> and then runs in the house and rapid fire humps the uh, stuffed duck and then goes to sleep. <laughs> goes to sleep. I'm like, oh man, okay, all right. What a yeah. Uh, what an interesting. I think the dog's only here to discover the plot point or the MacGuffin of the film. You know. Yeah. So. I just, I don't understand. That's the thing I don't understand about this movie. Yeah. Is Adam Sandler is constantly discovering new features of the remote by getting mad at something and pointing the remote at it. Yeah. It's like, in what universe do you do that? Yeah, it's like, easy answer. It's like a little kid. You know, he's like a little child and he's like, ah, I'm mad at this. But it's like, in what universe does even a little child do that with a remote? There's no rhyme or reason to it. Yeah, nobody goes around, you know, if they're, you know, say their wife is, you know, complaining at them or is like, oh, I wish I couldn't, I wish I couldn't hear you. I wish I could turn down the volume. <laughs> nobody does that. No. Nobody does that. Maybe he's just special, David, and we just don't know it. That was never communicated to us in the film. Could Adam Sandler be the world's most famous autistic Jew? <gasps> You read my mind. <laughs> so speaking of autistic Jews, he wakes up the next morning and he's really annoyed by, I believe, his wife's friend. It's not his sister-in-law, but his wife's friend, I believe. Yeah, yeah. This, I can't remember the lady's name, but she's been in a lot of different things. God, I don't remember her name. She's not popping up on here. Oh, it's a Julie Kavner, I believe. No? No, that's not right. Never mind. I don't know. But once she, she's one of those actresses. When you see her, you know exactly what she's from. Yeah, you recognize you've, you've recognized her. her. So, and she's also great. She's 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 awesome. But in this role, she's like extremely annoying, like a lot of characters in this film. And so Adam Sandler gets upset at her because she's annoying. And so he then proceeds to mute her with the remote and mutes her. Now the question, though, David, does this only apply to Adam Sandler? When he mutes things and turns down volume? Because the wife doesn't seem like she was reacting to it like he was. So I'm assuming that it's just affecting him. Yeah. It makes I sense. Would, I would have to say that given all the 
what turns out to happen in this film, I would, I would venture to say that only he's privy to the effects of the remote. Yeah, there are some things where, like, there were some question moments where I'm like, wait, is it, are other people seeing this? Like, he's doing it? But no, it seems like it's just him. Uh, so Jennifer Coolidge is her name, uh, who plays the lady. And so he mutes Jennifer Coolidge, tells her to get a life and a husband, and <laughs> she's just one of those, like, Adam Sandler characters. Again, like, it's an Adam Sandler character. They're varying degrees of insufferable as you, as you watch them go along. But anyway, I think my notes begin again, like probably 20 minutes later after this, like after we've gotten a lot of development with the remote. Um, I remember he skips like a whole evening dinner with his parents that night and he just skips it all and he fast forwards it and he gets to the end of it and he's like, oh, mom and dad. Oh, hi. I'm in my basement doing my work. Did you guys have a good time? And she's like, we had a great time, honey. And it was great. And of course, there's many um, jokes about Adam Sandler's genitalia. There's jokes about... Um, the, well, to be lots fair... Of things, lots of things. To be fair, at, before this... Um, uh, oh, our, we have flashbacks! Yeah, the, we the, have flashbacks. I forgot about them. We have flashbacks. We have flashbacks. Yes, his... Uh, uh, friend Morty, who gave him the remote. <laughs> walk. Um, he comes back. It's it's so weird how like Adam Sandler's character like never like is <laughs> suspicious. He just goes of this guy. Him. Yeah. Even though, so Morty gives him his card, mm-hmm. tells him, "Hey, give me a call if you need anything, <laughs> you need any help." And literally every single time. Adam Sandler's character is dialing the phone to call Morty for help. He literally just shows up like he's either knocking on the door or he just shows up out of nowhere. Mm -hmm. And of course it scares the bejesus out of him every time he does it, but he never thinks to be like, why am I, why am I going along with this guy? Like there's some, like why, why, Am I not questioning what's going on here? There's inconsistencies with um, the way he's reacting to this because he goes to the way beyond, and that's totally normal. Okay, okay, I could I could buy that from this character, but then like as you continue on, but it kind of makes sense, David. The magical stuff is happening with the remote, so he's kind of like, okay, this is just part of life now. This is okay. And then Morty comes in, he's like, oh my god, how did you show up so fast? So it seems like he's. Seems like he's just accepting it at this point, I guess. So yeah, um, at one point, Adam Sandler calls him up for help with the remote, and Morty shows up and shows him how to access the main menu the of main his life. Menu of his life. To where he gets some pretty interesting flashbacks, <laughs> including a scene oh, where he witnesses his own birth. From his own <laughs> perspective. perspective. And then here's the doctors and everyone else in the room remark about how small his wiener is. Yeah, it's like... Okay. And apparently he's insecure. <laughs> about his wiener. And so he brings it up awkwardly <laughs> to his parents. To his parents. Later. Later. It's like, what? What is happening? <laughs> Well, also, you forgot to mention the, the, the part where they're making him, David. Oh, yeah. The, <laughs> That's how it starts. He out. finds the special features. <laughs> special features. And, and he like goes making to. Making of. Making and he of. On it. <laughs> and at first, he doesn't know what's going on. And then he uh, soon realizes he's in his parents' bedroom when they were conceiving him. They're conceiving him. And it's, it's like, oh, my God. It was pretty funny. I'm not going to lie. But <laughs> it's just there's some really creative stuff in this film. Like I love the DVD menu. The whole aspect of that is hilarious, and it's such. It was made at just the right time, David. Because two years after this, we had Tropic Thunder, and after this, the world just went crazy with you know political correctness, all this kind of stuff. So we're never going to get films like this anymore, especially in this time frame, because this is mainly focused on like DVDs and physical media, that kind of stuff. So it's really hilarious. Like, nobody, like, ugh, it's just, you're never going to see something made like this again, like, in this concept. So it's it's very much a movie of the time, but appropriately so. 
Yeah, it's one of those things. It's definitely of its time, but because it's of its time, it, it's, it's never going to be again. And it's it, it's got a certain... I don't know how to describe this. This film has a certain whimsical magic to it. Probably because, you know, the remote does what it does. But there's also something else. Just just watching this film, there's something about this movie that just feels magical. And I don't I can't explain why. Maybe the same kind of magical when you're watching like Powerpuff Girls or something like that. <laughs> I don't know. I, I don't know. I just I can't explain it. There's some type of magic to this film. And maybe because it's an Adam Sandler movie, I don't know. But let's proceed on. So he figures out he can do lots of things with the remote. He can skip through things. And then the remote learns that, oh, you don't like having relations with your wife, so I'm going to skip it for you. I'm sure the remote has a Jewish accent, by the way, so I'm just going to keep going. <laughs> okay, so here we go. So we're going to skip this. And so it skips everything he skipped already, and it's learning how he interacts with it, what his uses are for it, and it remembers. So it continues to do the same thing. So it'll skip his commute in the morning. It'll skip every fight with his wife. It'll skip love, love, lovey-dovey time. And it'll skip a whole bunch of other things. And he's very, very happy with this. Very excited. But it comes to bite him later on. So he's in the car going to work. And he then realizes he can change the temperature of his skin and the color of his skin with the remote. So he gets to work. He's like, oh, I did it. It fast forward my commute. Thank God. I'm in the big city where I'm going to be a big businessman one day. And so he's in this. He's like, oh, let me get this tan going. And he grabs the remote and starts in the mirror looking at himself. And he's like, oh. And he changes into pink and orange. And then green. He's like, oh, I'm a hulk. <laughs> it's so great. This scene is so funny. It's just so, it's so great. So he, he's changing. He's trying to get a tan with the remote. <laughs> the remote, and then he does all kinds of colors. And it just it's it's hilarious. It's hilarious. So he then, s- s- <laughs> then proceeds to pick a tan. He looks exactly the same, and then he goes <laughs> into the building. So yeah, it's and then I wrote down. Is the is the harassment lecture here, or is it after the Japanese businessmen meet with? Them? I do believe that it's after the color changing scene. Okay, so it's right after the color changing scene. So the he goes into basically a sexual harassment um, training at his work right after that, and then he's able to change the language of David Hasselhoff, and David Hasselhoff is obviously you know this playboy type archetype that is uh, talking about sexual harassment, but it's hilarious that they're having him do it. And so it's a whole bit, you know, oh, there's sexual harassment. And then there's <gasps> homosexual harassment. And then there's just all these other like little, little bits as they go through it. But it's, it's, uh, it's, it's entertaining. So what did you think of this scene? <laughs> it was a very strange it's scene. So strange. It's like, and David Hasselhoff is like a total... <laughs> Total a hole. Total a hole. Total perv. Total horn dog in this movie. Yeah. Total womanizer. Total. Um, and <laughs> he's the one responsible for giving the, the sexual the harassment, harassment seminar. Seminar. It's very uh, interesting. Um, but oh, yeah, man. then you have the whole gag with the language changing, mm. and you know you have David Hasselhoff's, you know replacement Spanish-speaking voice actor <laughs> Which is giving awesome. the sexual harassment seminar. It's so great. And then Adam <laughs> Sanders is like, whoa. But he like speaks out loud, and then he realizes that he's speaking Spanish via, <laughs> you know, an alternate Spanish-speaking voice actor. So, yeah, it's... This is one of the best <laughs> bits of the film. Like, it's, it's hilarious. It's so great. Oh, my God. I, that one really hit home for me. Um, and so this establishes the remote can change languages and all this stuff. And this, when he was changing the language, David, that's when it hit me. Oh, does he, does it only affect him? Does everybody else see him speaking Spanish? Cause he's doing, he's like, ah, that's so funny. Isn't that funny? Everybody. And it seems like everybody's like perplexed. Like, Oh, well, what's going on with David Hasselhoff? Yeah. I don't think anybody else perceives this. Okay. Cause um, it, it, it just, it, it kind of. And it's seamless, seamless too. It's seamless yeah. too because it's like 
Adam Sandler himself is speaking in Spanish when he changes the language to Spanish, but it's like a it's like a different voice and it's like speaking for him like you know as like some like a company track, might like yeah. redub a movie to yeah. release it in another country you know <laughs> so someone's redubbed his life but i think he's the only one who's privy to it it reminds me were you here that one night when we had tsunami tuesday night and we watched ghost stories the one where it's like uh, yeah. intentionally a bad dub and they just created the story as they were going along dubbing the anime. I, I think so. Yeah, this, remi- this kind of reminded me of that. Like, there's certain parts in, for those who aren't aware, there was this anime called something in Japan. It came over here, and the company that got the rights to it renamed it Ghost Stories. And they had very little direction on translating it. So basically what they were doing is they were, like, basically creating a story as they were going along with the anime. And the voice actors got really into it. And they got like super like they basically just could do anything they want, and they basically went off the walls. Super offensive humor. It, it's it's a treasure to behold if you want to look it up. Ghost stories, anime. It's it, the dub. It's just it, it's insane. It's so hilarious. It's kind of because there's different parts in the dub where they go back to Japanese and they're like, "What the heck is he saying, bro?" And then they go back to English. <laughs> just little bits like that are just oh, it's so great. Um. So then we proceed to, he gets, uh, they meet with the Japanese businessmen. They're going to expand this hotel or something with uh, their company. And then Adam Sandler is able to translate what the the businessmen are saying. They're like, God, oh, these guys are so boring. I just want to go to a TGI Fridays. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, okay. And then like he's like, hey, I got an idea. They all sit back. They go off. He hears this conversation. They go back to the table. And he's like, hey. Forget this. All right, let's maximize profit, like what they were saying, the businessmen were saying. And he's like, and all this stuff, and blah, 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 blah. And then he's like, and let's get out of here, and let's go to a TGI Fridays. And then, like, <laughs> one of the Japanese men, what does he say, David? Like, does he? what does he say? He says, um... He says, F yeah. F yeah. And then they're but like, in, yeah. like, a really, in really thick, thick, heavy Japanese. Heavy Japanese. <laughs> you, you can barely understand you can barely, it. I get it, yeah. But it's there. <laughs> So then they go to a TGI Fridays and Housewives are like, what? Um, so I, I, I don't know what I wrote down. I wrote down how much money did they spend on this? This guy is so mean. Oh, we're getting to the end of the movie. Okay, so my notes basically go into the end of the film. But from here... This is where things start where to things shift. where things get shift. Because basically what happens is... Um, uh, David Hasselhoff is super impressed mm. that um, Adam Sandler was able to land this uh, account seemingly out of nowhere. And uh, so he's like, yeah, you get this for me and I'll make you my partner. And so he promises him that. And Adam Sandler's like, yeah, I just got to work for a few more months, get this done. And then... I'll be, you know, I'll be the partner. I'll be making I'll be the, the partner. Yeah. I'll be making the big bucks. And, and he keeps telling this to his wife and his kids. Like, this is the thing that's going to change our lives. Like yep. once I get to this point, daddy's going to change and he's going to be a great man, you know? Yep. And not an a-hole like he already is. Except what happens is he's, uh, tempted <gasps> by the powers of the remote powers. And he's basically like, well, it's only going to be a few months, right? And then, well, also, we have to establish here, David, before we go to close few months, that when he fast forwards, Morty tells him, oh, what well, basically you're in a autopilot state. So basically, when you're fast forwarding through these events, it's you and you're there. But you're non-responsive. You're kind of slow to talk. You're very much like a zombie pretty much a vegetative state, but you're walking around doing stuff, doing the routine, but that's about it. So there's no like deep conversations with his wife. There's no involvement with his parents. He's just like a zombie. Basically. Yeah. He's the lights are on, but nobody's home as right. Morty tells him. Yep. Um, yeah. So, it's only a couple months. Yep. <clears throat> so he's like, you know, what? it's like fast forward till I get promoted. And then what he doesn't realize is, I mean, he should have realized this. 
mm-hmm. is like David Hasselhoff's character is clearly a giant a hole <laughs> of just immense proportions. Yeah. And, but somehow he's shocked that it takes a year, a year. for him to be promoted and make partner. Mm-hmm. And this is where things spiral out of control because during that year, his marriage deteriorated to the point of breaking Mm -hmm. and he didn't know about it. And he's in therapy and he's like trying to figure out what's going on. And this is triggering more fights with his wife. This is triggering him just wanting to get through stuff more and more. And because we've already established the remote learns from his behavior and starts doing stuff on his own, the remote picks up on this and starts to fast forward, fast forward more and more and more and more of his life till you get to the point where he's fast forwards to he's the CEO of the company. His wife's divorced him and married another man, and he's become morbidly obese. (laughs) And he has no idea because he's just skipped through it all. Yeah, so it's like years and years and ten years go by, and it's just like, what is happening? I'm fat. Oh, no, and just the CGI is like something to behold in this film when he's fat. It's like, it's insane. So um, I wrote down the CGI is horrible. And then um, uh, he does improve the life of his uh, partner and hooking him up with Jennifer Coolidge, who was looking for a husband, and she has one now, so that's good. So in their living where? Like in the Mojave Desert or something? I don't remember. Somewhere. He He changes David Tasselhoff's life for the better at some point. Yeah, well, he hooks him up with... He hooks him up with his wife's friend. Yeah. And that becomes... And then it's so funny. It's like, well, you know what? We've been through some hard times in this last year. And she's like, yeah, we have. And he's like, my brother? Mm, Yeah, yeah. It's just like she cheated on him with his brother. And then they ended up back together. And so now they're happy. It's like, well, a lot happened in a year. Wow, okay. Yeah. So... (laughs) But yeah, you get to the point. So you're saying... So he fast forwards again. And he's CEO. And this is the future. So this is like 20... I think it's 2017. 2017. So it's not the future anymore. But apparently in 2006, they thought 2017 was going to be uh, um, like almost Star Trek level of technology. It's really <laughs> weird. I don't understand it. Yeah, it's like um, glass everywhere. It's like iRobot, basically, almost. So... It's lots of stuff is happening. So you get fat Adam Sandler. He's a CEO. He's all fat and I don't, and he's got a fro. Oh my God. So his wife, he lives in this giant, uh, giant hope, like complex in the city at the top floor. He's got everything. He's got the latest technology. He's fat. And he puts on some jogging shorts and some random clothes. And then he runs back to where his family lives and he walks through the door and who's on the couch but a 17-year-old Jonah Hill. And he's like, <laughs> my son, boy, what, what happened to you? And he's like, what happened to you? <laughs> That's so funny. It's so great. He's like, I'm never going to trust you again. He runs upstairs. And then his daughter comes down. He's like, don't you ever dress that way again, young girl. And he's like, hey, you hate me. And then she runs back upstairs. And then Kate Beckinsale comes in. And she's like, get out of here. You get out. And he's like, no, honey, I love you. What happened? She's like, you know what happened. You, it's all your fault. And then who walks through the door, David? Who walks back from upstairs, enters the glass door? It's none other than Sean Astin. Sean Astin, Mr. Speedo Man. He married Adam Sandler's wife. How could he? The nice guy. Can't believe it. The nice guy who was there for... Uh, Adam Sandler's wife and kids through the whole movie. Yeah. When Adam Sandler wasn't. Mm. And Adam Sandler is somehow shocked that 11 years in the future of him just being going through life on autopilot <laughs> till he became CEO <laughs> of the company that his wife hooked up with him. Yeah. It's a very big mystery. So 
at this point, the remote skips every time him and his wife have a fight. Yeah. So before anything happens and Sean Astin comes in, once Sean Astin comes in, he realizes, oh, she's starting to fight with me. Oh, no. So she, he pauses everything. And he's like, God, what am I going to do? So he's like, well, before I do, what I need to do, I'm going to do this. And he turns around and just woo, starts kicking out Sean Astin's character in the nuts like several repeatedly, repeated times while it's all in pause. And then he turns around and then he unpauses it and just shot ass. It's like, oh, and he just falls down behind him <laughs> as he tries to like talk to his wife and communicate, you know. So inevitably it happens and it starts fast forwarding on its own because him and his wife are having a fight. Well, the thing is, it mm. doesn't fast forward because of the fight. It fast forward because he gets sick. Oh, yeah. That's another thing that he decided to fast forward. So one weekend he was sick. He's like, uh, fast forward. And he's like, oh, my God, I'm not sick anymore. No more sniffles. The Twinkies killed, healed me. Yeah, so he fast forwards the whole weekend of being sick. And he's like, yeah, this is awesome. But then rolls around to this point in the film. He, like, trips and falls or something. Yeah, he hits the back of the brick. Like, and he, like, gets knocked out. But... When they rush him to the hospital, they find that he has cancer. <gasps> and so the remote fast forwards and skips his whole all of his cancer treatment. Yeah, it's like five years. So or it's something. like, it's, yeah. it's, I think oh, no, it's it like five years. It's five years. I've, I've, or no, six, because it's 2023. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, you're, right you're right. Yeah. You're right. Yeah. So 2023 is when this film finally is the final year it takes place. You're like, what? Or no, no not the final year, but it, 2023 is involved in it. Which you're like, well, that was not a little, that was not too long ago from our time. So, um, oh, <laughs> I forgot back when he was in the house, he's yelling at Jonah Hill and he's running away. So he's like, come on, I love you. You remember that? Oh, yeah. <laughs> he says in this yeah. really big, deep voice. He's yeah. He's like, come on, I love you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, that was so funny. So, yeah, 2023. He's there, and he has cancer, and I don't remember what happens after this. David is... Well, he wakes up, he in, the wakes up in the hospital. He wakes up in the hospital. The cancer's dealt with. He's also gotten gastric bypass surgery, so he's thin again. <laughs> but uh, he has a huge... He has a huge flap, but he's thin again. He's <laughs> thin again. He's old. He's old. He's visibly aged, but he's mm. thin again. And his <laughs> son, who was a who was Jonah Hill before is played by someone else now because his son is now thin, not because of gastric bypass, but because his new Sean Astin, his new stepdad, you know, yeah. took Jake him Hoffman a, comes in and plays uh, his son now. Yeah. It took, uh, took him exercising, you know? Yeah. yeah. He's so like, they both, so both him and his son end up thin again, but mm. through completely different means. And he skips this whole thing because he was sick with cancer the entire time. Yeah. Um, yeah, so he wakes up in the hospital. Um, his son's getting married. Um, he sort of kind of kind of starts the reconciliation process. Um, he then hears that his father is dead. He's dead. Henry Winkler, his father, is, is dead. He's bit the dust. So yeah. him and his son go into his grave or something. He's so sad. He cries. Well, no, he doesn't go. His son doesn't go to the grave. Oh, he, just goes, he goes. He goes to the grave and by Morty himself. Shows up. Morty shows up. Yeah, Morty shows up, and this is where this is where the big spoilers start well, happening. I, I think it happens just a little later, doesn't? Because he does the flashback first with his dad, right? No, 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 no. Show no. me my last time. No, 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 no. So he That's learns later. that his okay. he learns that his. Dad's dead, Dad's dead yeah. from his son. Mm. Like his son mentions it in passing, and is like, "Oh, yeah, Grandpa died." Yeah. Um, and he's like, "What?" And he goes to his dad's gravestone, and he's mourning his dad. And then he's trying to get the remote to take him to the moment his dad died. But then Morty shows up and explains. That he can't go there because he wasn't there. Mm. 
And at that point, he says, okay, take me to the last time I saw him. And this is where the movie really starts to uh, shift into something totally. much less comedic, mm. um, quite depressing. So, yeah, this scene is like... Oh, oh, man. It's terrible. It's It's the most heartbreaking scene of the film, but also... It's probably the best scene in the movie, I'd say. Like it's so effective and and just tragic. And they really do a good job here because it is sad. So, yeah, he he sees his he goes back to this point. It's his son comes he's at the desk, so he's on autopilot obviously. The son comes in, he's like, "Oh, hey, I got all these cool things, you know." And Adam Sandler's commenting, "Oh, wow, he's just got some really great designs. Like this kid's a genius. Like my son's doing a really awesome job in in his job." And him in that time when he was on autopilot, he's like, "Yeah, sure, whatever." Yeah. And then continues his work. And then proceeds. Henry Winkler walks in, a very old looking Henry Winkler walks in and it's like, "Oh, son, I thought we could have dinner tonight. I thought we could do this and that, and then maybe go." Out for the day or something. And then Adam Sandler continues to like, nah, whatever, I don't care. And then Henry Winkler starts doing his famous magic trick that's been established in the film with a coin. And you know, it's you know, it's you know, something you humor somebody usually and you will watch it. And then just Adam Sandler autopilot just goes off and just like tells his dad off, rejects him. Yeah, well basically, so it's already established in the film that um, he already knows that his dad does this quarter trick with a, with a uh, trick quarter that he bought in a magic shop. It's not a real quarter. Um, it's a trick quarter. And, but to humor his dad, he pretends he doesn't know. And he doesn't know. He d- pretends for years. For years. For years. And now on autopilot... His dad's trying to interact with him, and his persona in autopilot is to brush everyone off and to get them away from him so that he can continue his work. Mm. Because generally, he's fast forwarding through sections of his life where he's working towards a goal. Yeah. Um. So his whole persona in autopilot is to brush everyone off so he can get back to doing his work, and so his, uh, yeah, his. Dad pulls out the old, like, I'll show you how I do the quarter trick if you really want me to. And autopilot Adam Sandler, like a complete and utter jerk, is like, I know how you do the stupid quarter trick. Now go away and let me work. Yeah. You're like, so awful. So awful. It's like, oh my God. Like, in poor hair. It's like, it's Henry Winkler. How could you treat Henry Winkler like this? Especially if he's your dad. So it's a very effective scene, really, really sad. And then basically, literally the same day or the next day, Henry Winkler's, his dad dies. Well, I don't know if it's the next day or, it, we don't know because oh, this, yeah, that's, that's the, know. that it, interaction is the last time Adam Sandler ever saw his dad. Saw him, yeah. Yeah. And so then he flashes back to reality, he's still in front of the gravestone, and... The spoiler happens. The, oh yeah, the spoiler Before happens. Um, our character Morty, Morty makes an offhand comment Morty. about how he didn't enjoy taking him, but it was his time. Ooh. And Adam Sandler's like, what are you taking him? What do you mean? And Morty's like, in you know, typical Christopher Walken style, he's like, <laughs> I'm, an, I'm an angel, Michael. <laughs> and... And Adam like, Sandler's like, what? "What an angel!" And he's like, "I'm the angel of death." <laughs> Spoilers. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so yeah, he's he's been playing Adam Sandler all along. He's the angel of death. He gave him the remote. He's supernaturally there. It explains everything, apparently. So, how the angel of death got a hold of his remote? I don't know. Does he give Roman uh, Julius Caesar this remote, but it's in the form of a pendulum back in the day? I don't know. Is it in the form of a sundial? I mean, just think. Just think. If they made an MCU-style franchise out of Click... A prequel to Click where it's Adam Sandler as Julius Caesar? 
I pay money to see that. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Kate Beckinsale is Cleopatra. <laughs> Oh, that would be awesome. This would, and then it brings back every all the actors. Christopher Walken comes back. Henry Linker comes back. Henry Winkler is so okay. Okay, picture this, David. Picture this. Henry Winkler is actually Joseph, the father of Jesus. And then we follow <laughs> Jesus's story in this movie as well. Oh God! And it's not Click, but what would he be called? I don't know. I mean, you can't call it Click Clicker. Click two. The uh, clickening? And what sort of gadget? Yeah, is, what gadget is What sort be? of gadget is a, a the angel of death played by Christopher Walken <laughs> gonna give someone in the first century? A sundial. A sundial? <laughs> a magic sundial. A, a universal sundial. A universal sundial. It's like, wow. The dog's humping some like bronze statue in the background. Yeah. Oh God! Oh God! I'd pay money to see that. So anyway, <laughs> um, yeah. Basically, I'm at the end of my notes. Though I say this film is truly effective. What it sets out to do. Um, before I get to my last note, let's kind of wrap up the plot. So, how does this end, David? He. So yeah, he, uh, he basically fast forwards again, right after this. Uh yeah, he or something triggers it to fast forward. Um, oh, he says, uh, "Fast forward to the next time I'm happy." And then it fast forwards to our last time jump, which is his son's wedding. Mm, I'm pretty sure. Uh, oh, no, no. no? So okay. the son's wedding is before that. Oh, it is. Oh, you're. It, before he fast forward, because he's still ambulatory. He's walking around. Yeah. And, but yeah. He's, and he's not fat. Yeah. So he's clearly. Um, so, he, yeah, he. He sees his son's wedding, and he makes lots of the. I'm pretty lots of, sure he fast forwards, David. No, no. Remember, in the dance, he has the the heart attack. Yeah, yeah. No, yeah. that's 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 after. Okay. So okay, so before, so he's okay. got the revelation that mm. um, Morty's the angel of death and took his dad, and he gave him this remote to I don't teach him a lesson i guess i don't know I guess, what yeah. the purpose was yeah so he at this point he just kind of goes along with his life and the big thing that's happening is his son's wedding mm. and this is where he kind of starts to reconcile with people mm -hmm. um he starts to reconnect with his children his he, mother is there yeah he has a moment um he has a moment where he kind of reconnects with his wife even though they're separated mm. Um, and he, uh, he even pantses Sean Astin and reveals yet another Speedo. <laughs> and it's, yet another uh, Speedo. You know. And everybody's oh, got really old makeup on. Yeah. Heartwarming scene. Heartwarming scene. But then he has a heart attack <gasps> and he passes out. And of course, you know, he, the remote fast forward, however long it takes, it's like a year or no, something. No, 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 they, this was their honeymoon, remember? This was the next day. Oh, that's right, yeah, that's right. Yeah, so, but, yeah. so, so, I guess. he's in the hospital. He's in the hospital, but he wakes up after they've treated him for um, whatever, like, it, whatever was it was. Like a heart attack. That uh, caused a heart attack. Hmm. And, yeah, so he finds out that. So he's in the hospital and he's weak and he finds out that his uh uh son is going to be just as much of a douche as him and instead of going on a honeymoon with his wife he's going to go on a uh business trip or do something yeah. and they're going to put off their honeymoon so that uh his son can work on this important project. Mm -hmm. His son's much more nicer and much more well mannered, of course. But, but he's making the same mistakes. He's making the same mistakes, and um, before Adam Sandler can do or say anything about it, you know they leave, and Adam Sandler panics. No, he's like, he's like, I gotta go. So he escapes the hospital. He's still in his hospital gown. He can barely walk, and he, um, he does a weird. Weird, uh, weird gag about oh, what's the dude that huh? it, 
Oh, the nurse that comes by? The, the nurse, and he's like, oh, is that... What does he say? What uh, name does he say? What is that? Because the nurse stops him. Uh-huh. The nurse stops him. And he's like, hey, you're not going... You're not going anywhere. Yeah. And he's like got a needle with a sedative in it, ready to go. <laughs> and Adam Sandler's like, hey, is that blah, blah, blah? And the nurse, he, the nurse actually somehow falls for that. He's like, <laughs> oh, it is? And he turns around and Adam Sandler, in, somehow in his weakened state, is able to slap this <laughs> sedative into the nurse's... <laughs> Into the nurse's skin instead of his, <laughs> and he goes out. I can't remember the name I that can't he remember. says. He says some like celebrity or something. Is that show and show? And he's like, "What is it?" Or something to that extent. Oh yeah, what? Oh, it's it was Colin like, Farrell. Oh, <laughs> it's Col- He's <laughs> like, he said? "Is that Colin Farrell?" <laughs> and the nurse is like, "Whoa, what?" I totally don't remember. <laughs> that. Yes, that was so. That's the thing that really surprised me about this movie oh. is. Seeing it again after so many years, the thing that really stuck in my mind is like just how depressing the plot turns. To, so it was like I forgot that through the whole movie, there's stupid gags through the whole movie. <laughs> it's still desperately trying to hold on to the veneer of being a comedy, even though by that point it's clearly not. So you have sick Adams, old Adam Sandler going, "Oh, is, is that Colin Farrell over there?" And then. <laughs> slaps a needle with a sedative into the nurse into the nurse who's trying to restrain him and uh yeah so he runs out <laughs> and he's like can barely walk and he's like yelling for his son and it's the most pathetic sound you've ever heard in your life this man is <laughs> bad bad yeah this man is clearly at the end of his rope and he <laughs> falls over and just j- like just manages to catch his son's attention yeah. as he's about to leave yeah. forever. Mm-hmm. Um, and they, so they all go back and um, his wife, his, his ex-wife, Sean Astin, both of his kids, they all surround him as he's laying there in the rain on the ground dying. And that's the one thing I like about, sorry to interrupt you, but that's one thing I like about this is that, even though he's a total a hole and has been for his whole whole career as a father, maybe even before then, his whole life. And even that, even though that's the case, his wife still helps take care of him when he was having cancer, still invest time with him with the kids. Still the kids still love him because they're his dad. It's like and he sees how humble and he gets humbled by that. And that was something that was really cool that stood out to me. He he start once this reconciliation process was starting, he starts realizing, wow, I got it like really good. Like this family, like I have wonderful kids. My wife is not with me anymore, but she's still here. It's it was very touching, very touching for sure. And so they're all surrounding him, David. And then what happens? And then so he basically he makes his peace with every single one of them. Um he he makes his son promise that he's not that he's going to go on his honeymoon and he's going to put his family first from now on um and he just you know they're all crying and he's and the he can barely you know, talk yep yeah, everything goes dim everything goes black he sees christopher walking off in the distance or something and then boom he wakes up and he's in bed bath and beyond <gasps> It, it was, was all a dream. It was all a dream. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, oh my God, it was all a dream. And then he sees the guy that doesn't work there that, was, that he saw earlier. And he's like, what, 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 what's happening, sir? He's like, oh God, you're, you're here. You're alive. Oh my God. And he's like giving this man a hug. And he's like, I was just watching you sleep. And he's like, I'm so happy I'm alive. <laughs> and he's like, my dog, family, dog, oh! And then he, he runs home. He hops in the car, throws the Wendy's out the window. And then he gets to the house. He wakes up his kids. He bangs a pot with a spoon. He's so happy. Mary, Mary, I'm home. Like, it's just total, it's a wonderful life. Hello, Bedford Falls. We're here. All life is good. 
is smoking hot white, as Christopher Walken puts it. And then he's he's like, oh, we're, I'm done. I've quit my job. I'm like, we're going to go camping this weekend. Ah, I love you, honey. Oh, Bedford Falls. <laughs> <laughs> oh, hey, Merry Christmas, Potter. Oh. <laughs> so <laughs> he goes, the kids run upstairs. His wife then runs upstairs. The dog... What does he do to the dog? He brings him a new toy or something? No, or? no. Oh, he gets a new dog. He gets a new dog. For the dog. This is this is how this is how ridiculous <laughs> this, this how ridiculous this bit dog is. Dog humping the duck thing is <laughs> that the end of the movie is him's like, oh man, you know, you've been humping this stuffed duck this whole time. <laughs> You know, you deserve the real thing. Oh my god! And he brings in a lady dog. Lady dog. Like, it's got like a bow, like a pink <laughs> bow on it or whatever. It's an English bulldog. And they just and the dog's like, oh, he's so beautiful. Yeah, there's this like slow mo moment where they're like looking <laughs> at each other, and then it just kind of like, oh, the the new dog goes straight to humping the duck. <laughs> the duck. And then the other dog joins in humping Show the duck. The dog. And it's in slow motion. It's in slow motion. And Adam Sandler's like got this like dumbfounded look on his <laughs> face. It's like, it's like, how? Why did you why? need to take this gag that far? Why? I gotta admit, it's pretty funny. But it, why? It's dumb. <laughs> so anyway, after the wife runs upstairs and the dogs continue humping the duck, he looks back into the kitchen, David, and he sees the clicker. Oh, yeah. Wrapped up with a bow and a card. And he opens the card. And what does it say? I, I actually don't remember. Yeah, it says, uh, it's a card from Morty. Mm. And it says here, ba- it basically says here, I have a feeling you'll do the right thing this time. And yes. Adam Sanders like, oh, yeah, yeah. And yeah. he's like, P.S., your your wife still has a smoking hot body. <laughs> it's like, what the heck? That's also another running That's gag. That's also another running gag. Is Morty. Morty. It's like Christopher Walken's like, wow, you got your wife is smoking hot. <laughs> yeah, Morty, yeah, Christopher Walken's character just cannot help but Can't comment help how. The Grim Reaper cannot help himself but comment on Kate Beckinsale. Yeah, it's so weird. Probably because she was in the Underworld movies. That's probably why. Oh, yeah. That makes there, sense. there you there go. There we go. Uh, we figured it We've out. We've cracked the code. We cracked the code. And click. No more analysis needed. <laughs> so what does he do? He takes the remote. And he throws it in the trash. Throws it in the trash. And he there's a scene before where he tries to throw the remote away, and it keeps oh, popping God, up back in his hand. I forgot about that. So he's like checking his hands like, oh, it's not popping back up again. <laughs> it's finally gone, and he goes and he lives his life, and things are you know happily ever after. Happily ever after, and then come, uh, what's it called? You get what you give. Starts playing. It's all happy and and go lucky, and we hit credits, and the movie's over. Thank God, <laughs> we made it through the click. So, final thoughts, David. Click, I. <sighs> I don't like giving movies scores, and I'm not going to give this a score. No, it's this movie I, I doesn't would, deserve a score. It doesn't deserve a score. I don't think it deserves a recommendation. I Here's what I'll say. It's one of those films you should probably watch at least once in your life and then be done with it. It's yeah. one of the, I would say it's one of like maybe the top 200 movies. It's in there that you, maybe you should watch it. It's a great movie in the sense of just how unique it is mm. and how well executed certain elements of it are yeah but it's also got just all you know oh man all insufferable the, adam all sandler the baggage movies. of late period adam sandler <laughs> movies so it's like a weird mix of like genius and dumb <laughs> i just, i don't know how else to explain it it's like genius certain certain things just like whoa that's amazing. And then certain parts are like, that's the dumbest thing I've ever seen. <laughs> oh man. Yeah. Yeah. It's um it's something. I mean, I if you're gonna watch, if you've never seen an Adam Sandler movie, don't start with this. Yeah, go don't watch, start with this. Go one. watch Happy Gilmore, go have a good time, and then just go from there. Um what I will say is as the years went on, 2012 Adam Sandler, early 2010 Adam Sandler, he got a little bit more family friendly, a little bit more. 
he started focusing more on kids' films. But at the same time, we then got Jack and Jill, we got Blended, and all this crap that I'm surprised he still has a career. But probably because he knows a lot of people over at Netflix. Oh, and yeah. without Jack and Jill, David, we would have never gotten Uncut Gems. Oh, my God. <laughs> Which I still really want to watch. I remember, uh, uh, shout out to Matt, he, your brother, he recommended it to me. And he's like, no, you got to watch it. It's actually really good. And I was like, and for, that's from Matt. And I'm like, okay, well, I guess I should watch it. So maybe we should watch, maybe we should go with Uncut Gems at some point. Yeah, well. F- Movies about, <laughs> we'll watch that in Joker and there we go. Dude, dude, no, no. <laughs> Even better. We'll watch that and we'll watch Funny People. <laughs> funny People? Wait, what? That's that's uh, Adam Sandler's other serious movie. Oh no! Oh. <laughs> yeah, two <laughs> films with Adam Sandler in it. Yeah, two non-comedies with Adam Sandler in them. <laughs> oh um, man! <laughs> so I don't know if I'd recommend this film. I think it's fine. Well, I would recommend it. Not that like. You're gonna watch it and you're gonna like think it's the greatest movie ever. No, no. But I would recommend it in that you should watch it to see what you think about yeah, to it. See what you think about it. Because yeah. it's something you just gotta experience. It's it definitely is an experience that if you don't experience in your life, you're probably gonna have regrets. I'm gonna be real. <laughs> like, even though this movie's like insufferable, disappointing dad kind of face that I have with this film. I still thoroughly laugh throughout the entire movie. Like, as dumb as it is, I laugh through the whole film. I love you! <laughs> just all those little scenes and little bits. Even the dog thing, which is so stupid, has a funny payoff in the end. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like... And all the acting's great. Maybe Adam Sandler's weird at some points, but it's just him trying to be this, this loser, you know? So... Um, yeah, I think, th- as I said before, I'm glad the movie got made <laughs> and I think the universe would be in much worse place without click. All right. So colossal. So this is our second movie here. This film was released in 2016 starring Anne Hathaway and it had a budget, David. I was very surprised of $34 million. Wow. Pretty expensive. As well as it came in with a whopping, it made a whopping $4.5 million. So this movie was a flop. But let that not sway your viewing of this film. This, I think, it's really hard to describe this film without, like, talking about spoilers. Kind of like Stay was. Like, there's a whole concept of this film that's kind of integral to it. But basically... This film has to do with a lady who moves back home from New York. It's a party chick. And she learns on the news that there's a monster attack in Seoul, Korea. South Korea. And then she finds out she has something to do with it. And that's all you need to know. So how did we find this movie, David? Was it... Um, I remember we were looking at movies. So basically you found what a happened... Couple and you said colossal and i'm like what the heck's colossal so basically what happened was um so we were like basically we were talking about click and how it's just this bizarre tonal shifting movie and Mm -hmm. we're like we gotta find some other tonal shift movie to pair it with and do a podcast on it Mm -hmm. and so i remember I think we both started Googling some things. And we and wanted I found to make a, sure it was not a movie that was well-known. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was our goal. Like, Click is a well-known, I guess, movie, but nobody it's really... It's well-ish. It's well-ish, but it's not. people don't go back to it a whole lot. Yeah. So it's kind of good to take a look at these kind of things again. So we did some research, and I ended up stumbling upon a a Reddit thread where someone was asking that very thing. Like, what are some movies with, like, uh, tonal shifts in them? And there was a whole lot of suggestions. And that very... People in that thread actually recommended Click uh, as one of them. So I was like, I'm on the right track here. (laughs) And so I think I found a few potential candidates 
in that um, in that thread, and Colossal was one that neither of us had ever seen, but from the way people in the thread were describing it, it sounded kind of a little in, kind of in the same ballpark as Click, where it's either billed as a comedy or it has the trappings of a comedy, um, and it turns into something non-comedic yeah, it, it's, by the end. It's like a drama slash comedy. You think it's going to be this romantic comedy. Yeah. It's, and then it turns into a fantastic, and then it brings a fantastical element into it. Yeah. And that's not even the, that's not even the biggest shift. That's not even shift. the total shift though. Yeah. That's not even the total shift. Yeah. It's like, it presents itself as like a, as like a weird rom-com. Yeah. It's like, a. it's kind of like. Like you, you mentioned the budget was surprisingly high. It was like yeah, and the million, the right? budget's high, I think, because of the fantasy elements that it brings in. Mm. If that, if it didn't have that, this movie would have been quite a low budget movie. Yeah. From the way it's shot, the way it looks, it's it looks great. Not it looks fine, but yeah. you can tell that other than the fantasy parts, not a lot of mo- money was spent to make this. So it's like this low budget sort of like well even for being take on like your normal take on like your normal rom-com basically Mm -hmm. that's how it presents itself yeah and it's not like even the cgi as you get into the movie like it's not bad cgi it's just like like they do smart things like it's the cgi is only taking place in the dark uh, at at nighttime which is kind of smart so that kind of saves a lot of detail However, it's still not bad looking CGI. It's not half bad. I mean, this also was 2016, so it's not really that bad at all, really. Yeah, the movie is doesn't look bad per se, yeah. but you can tell that other than the CGI, not a lot of movie money was spent to make it. Yeah, and um, it was written and directed by this guy named Nacho Vigalando, and starring Anne Hathaway, Jason Sudeikis, Tim Blake Nelson and Dan Stevens. And Dan Stevens is actually our first character we meet in the film. And I was like, oh my God, it's Dan Stevens. <laughs> <laughs> I did that a lot through this movie. I did that a lot through Click, too. I'm like, oh my God, it's David Hasselhoff. Oh my God, it's Jonah Hill. What the heck? Oh, I can't believe this person's... Uh, Sean Astin in a Speedo? What? <laughs> um, but yeah, that was when I was like, holy crap, Dan, St- Dan Stevens is in this. And then like, because we had no idea what we were getting into. We booted up. We go to what was it? Tubi is where we watched. Yeah, it, it was Tubi. We, we go to Tubi, which we've I've never used Tubi, and then we press play, and I'm like, oh god, there's so many ads, and like we watch f- four ads before the movie starts. We're like, all right, you know, we're watching this for free, so that's fine. You know, okay, I'll I'll give it that. So <laughs> it opens with this scene in South Korea. This little girl and her mom are in this park, and they lost her doll or something. And they're speaking Korean, and we're like, what are we watching right now? Yeah, What's I think happening? we kind of like mistook it for Japanese at first. Yeah, too. we're like, is this in Japan? What? And then, <laughs> which you know, incredibly racist of us. How dare we? I know. The pa- All those Asians, they look the same. <laughs> <laughs> Sound the same, too. No, I'm just like, kidding. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Um, we're really bringing in our inner white guy here. You know? Oh, so, yeah. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. Like we usually do. Got to bring that offensive uh, colonial flair. <laughs> I used colonial. Oh, okay, so it opens up with this scene. <laughs> David. We only use the word colonial, David, when we're referring to the Brits. Dan Stevens is a Brit, so we're going to refer to him as, you get out of here, boy. <laughs> You're in the yeah. you're in the you're part of the part of the colonies right Damn now. Damn colonizer! Damn colonizer! <laughs> so anyway, this little girl's like, "Oh, mommy, I found my doll." Translate that into South into Korean, and then, <laughs> and then she's like, "Oh, good job, honey." And then like they're walking away, and then like, and then like, what? Oh my God, is it Godzilla? Is, is this Japan? No, it's South... Wait, what is that? Is it, what the heck is a giant monster in the sky? Lightning flashes in the sky, and you I think you see the outline of it, you right? See the, I think you see part of it. I don't think you see it. I think you just see oh. the outline of it because it cuts really quickly to the little girl's face. She's like, and, ah! 
Yeah, she screams. And then she says Gojira, and then when we go on, no, no, no. she doesn't say Gojira. <laughs> no, that was that was my reaction. That was your reaction when she yeah. screamed, I was like Gojira. But it's not really Gojira because we are we can't say that for copyright reasons. But it's Gojira. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, it then cuts to <laughs> this apartment complex in New York, and it shows Dan Steven eating a bowl of cereal. At his in this apartment, and he's very, very mad, very upset. You can you can tell he's agitated to a great degree. And then all of a sudden, the door is open. The door opens, and comes stumbling in with her arms shaking as Anne Hathaway. Oh, she's a party girl, and she hasn't grown up yet, and she's in her thirties, and she's with this guy, Dan Stevens. He says, "That's enough. I've I'm done with you." Those are your bags. I packed them up for you. Get out of my apartment. So instead of that, he says, okay, now I'm going to go to work. And so he leaves. <laughs> so he leaves. And then all of her friends that she apparently was with just now walk in and just start drinking all of the drinks at like 10 a.m. in the morning. So, yeah, they were like waiting for him to leave. Yeah, waiting for him to leave. They then come into the apartment. She's like, oh, my God, my heart. And then, like, as she's palpitating and she's like, ah, I think I'm going to die. Her friends are, like, walking in, grabbing the bourbon, grabbing the whatever, and then they just start having a good time. So it's like, okay, man, this shouldn't be two films about two tonal shifts. This should be about two losers in these films. That's Two utter jackasses. Two utter jackasses. So anyway, so I'm like, what are we watching? So... Anne Hathaway finds herself in a taxi. She gets to this house that's empty out in the suburbs somewhere. It's a really nice house, two story. Apparently, it's her parents' place. Yeah, they basically, they uh, yeah they don't live there anymore, and they're not renting it out. So she's like, "Well, I'll go stay there." It's a pretty good property right there. So anyway, so she goes there, stays there. She has no survival skills, so she just sleeps on the floor. She doesn't go get anything the first night. She just sleeps on the ground. Um, she then goes and finds a blow-up mattress at some store. She walks to the store, and then she comes back. And as she's coming back, we're like, "What is she? What's in the bag? What is she? What did she buy?" Because we don't know. It's not told to us. It just she gets out of the store with this giant bag. And then who pulls up right next to her in a pickup truck and whole good old homeboy, Hallmark movie, love guy, archetype. It's none other than Jason Sudeikis. So Jason Sudeikis pulls up next to Anne Hathaway and he's like, hey, need a ride? You okay? And then she's like, no, I'm okay. And then he gets out and says, oh, that's okay. I'll help you. So he helps her load in the car, and then they're driving along, and this very nice guy. And then I'm like, man, is this is what's gonna happen? Is this is he okay? Is he okay? And then he's like, oh, I recognize you. You're so and so. We used to go to high school. We used to go to school together. And it turns out they actually went to elementary school together. And this is the town where they both grew up. And Jason Sudeikis stayed here, and Anne Hathaway went to the big city. So it's got the hallmark. The markings of a Hallmark movie all over it. Oh, yeah. And, I mean, I, I, he's wearing flannel, too, so you know he's a Hallmark movie main character. So, Jason Sudeikis, I just want to point out, is quite charming throughout this whole film. He is... I, I always knew he was a good actor, but I never really... I didn't watch, like, the more recent stuff like Ted Lasso or anything, but I wouldn't be surprised if this is one of his roles that got him that role. Because him as this character, I don't know his name, but he is just so delightful. Oscar. He's so delightful and kind and just a chill dude. And he's definitely like, oh, he's the good guy archetype that the girl doesn't appreciate. So he plays it really well. And he's just super likable. So shout out to, J to Jason Shadakish. Great guy. So as we go along on this film, David, I fail to remember what's after this, but uh Yeah, well I, basically he um He helps her out. He helps her out, and then he gets it turns out that he's inherited his dad's bar mm. and he um has closed off part of it 
uh, and renovated the other part. Mm. And so he gets Anne Hathaway a job at the bar. Mm, being a bartender. Uh, introduces her to his friends. Tim Blake Nelson's in this movie, David. <laughs> what? Yeah. Like randomly, Tim Blake. Tim Blake Nelson's always in some of these random uh, movies, like especially in indie, indie movies. And there's, I, he's awesome. I love Tim Blake Nelson. So he's here. Uh, another actor by the name of Austin Stowell is here, and these are his Jason Sudeikis buddies. And so he introduces them to her, and. My, I wrote down in my notes, d- she just hangs out there all day? Like, like all day? I also wrote down Sup, Joel, and I don't know why. Sup, Joel. Like, the name, like, well, Sup, Joel. Like, that kind of thing. I don't know why I wrote that down. I don't know. Well, but I it mean, doesn't matter, because we get an ad part. An ad, an ad, an ad break at this point. <laughs> an ad break. On Tubi. <laughs> we watch this on Tubi. Oh, that's great. So, um... Let's see. So we get an ad. They hang out, drink a bunch. She somehow finds her way home. Or no, no, she doesn't. Yeah, she goes to a like a little playground and sleeps yeah. on the park bench. Like a homeless person. Um, so, I, yeah, I wrote down, is she able to make it back there alive? Is, is, what, I, is what I wrote down. And then she wakes up. She then notices kids going to school. And she's like, oh, that's weird. And this is with something that happens again. But she notices kids goes to school. She's by this park. There's this playground next to her. She then proceeds to find herself home after that. She opens up her mattress. She, uh, she has nothing to blow it up. <laughs> and so she rolls out the mattress and sleeps. And then I wrote down in my notes for some reason how racist of us. And I have no memory of why. Why were we racist, David? I don't know. Was it because of South Korea? Oh, because when she goes to sleep. Oh yeah, on her laptop. Because this is where this is where she, uh, after she wakes up, um, after she wakes up <laughs> from sleeping on this unblown up air mattress, um, like somebody contacts her. Oh, it's Dan Stevens. Yes, he checks in on her. He yeah uh, he contacts her and he's like hey did you hear and and she's like no, no and what's going on she opens up her laptop and uh, you know navigates to some sort of news website Google is used in the film so thank you for being accurate guys you know? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah she finds out that uh, during the night there was an attack by some gigantic creature on uh, in Seoul, South Korea. Mm, yes. So that might have been why you wrote down we were racist because it, was, it said Seoul, and then as soon as, like, in the news headline of the video oh, she was watching. Oh, because at this point we thought it was Japan. Yeah, yeah. So uh, it says yes. Seoul, and I'm like, wait a second. That scene in the beginning, that wasn't Japan. That was South Korea. And we're like, wow, how racist of us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. So uh, from there, we get another ad break Oh yeah, in Tubi. So we go from there. Uh, again, this film, it, it's, it's about two tonal shift films, but it's also two films about complete and utter losers as our main protagonist. Um, so she finds out about this. Jason Sudeikis shows up, and he's like, oh, hey, I have this TV for you. She's like, what? I didn't ask for a TV. He's like, yeah, you did. Last night when we were talking. And she has no memory of it. And she's like, oh, okay. Um, okay, cool. And so he brings out this pretty old tube TV that's kind of like. I don't old, think it's a tube it's TV. It's not a tube TV, but it's, it's a, a transitional. Projection, it's a projection TV. It's a projection TV. So it's like on the borderline of when Flat Screens HD came out and all this kind of stuff. Well, I mean, this was before. This was before modern flat screens. This yeah, was yeah. Uh, projection TVs for those who are for maybe those uninitiated. too young. Projection TVs were a weird uh, thing that existed before modern flat screens. And they were essentially, essentially what they were intending to deliver was 
big screen TV with yeah. a flat screen instead of a curved screen like a CRT. Yeah. Um, but, but they didn't have the technology quite yet. They didn't have the technology they have nowadays. Uh, so projection TVs were gigantic and bulky, and the screen, the image was always really dark compared to CRTs. I don't know what pro- technology they exactly work on, but for whatever reason, projection TVs, even though the image quality is quite crisp, um, it's very dark. Very dark, yeah. I think so, me, yeah. me and my, my parents had one for a while at some point. Yeah, and we're so like, man, every movie's so dark. <laughs> so yeah, basically he wheels in this gigantic projection huge TV. Huge TV. It probably weighs like 200 300 pounds on the wheels. It's huge. So he brings it in, sets it up for her randomly. Oh, it's just got channels already. Okay, cool. So he sets it up for her real cool and he's like, "Oh, you're a uh, Oh, and she it's at this point she finds out oh, I do have a blower upper for my mattress or something. So she starts blowing it up and she leaves it on as she goes, answers the door and, and let's Jason Sudeikis in with a TV. And then she goes back and it's still there. I'm like, God, woman, like girl, like what are you doing? Like she's, oh my God. Just, she's a mess. She's a mess, man. She's a mess. So, and Jason Sudeikis is being good to her. He's like, you know what? No worries. You can tell he likes her. So it's like he's trying to be good to her, trying to be a nice guy. But again, he's just undoubtedly charming. I can't get over how charming this man is. But we will get into more later of that. So at this point, she's like, oh, my God, thank you for bringing the TV. I'm, I guess so. You know what? And he's like, all right, well, where are you going to go to work? And she's like, what do you mean go to work? And he's like, well, I gave you a job, and I need you there early. And so <laughs> he gives her a ride to the bar. She does her shift. They see on the TV that the monster attacked. And, you know, oh, my God, the world's ending. This is crazy. And then, oh, shoot, what happens after that, David? It's, um, does she go home or does she fall asleep at the thing? I think she well, goes but, home. Yeah, no, no. So what happens is is the same thing happens after a shift at the bar. She hangs out late. She drinks. Mm -hmm. She gets shwasted. Shwasted and stumbles around the town. Stumbles around, stumbles to that same playground, sleeps on the park bench once more. Once more. Wakes up with the school children (laughs) and finds her, walks through the playground, finds her way home. That'd be really... If I was a kid and I'm going to school that morning, I'm like, God, that woman... She started showing up like two or three days ago. Like, why does she always sleep on that park bench? It's creeping me out. You mm-hmm. know? Um, but anyway, so oh, let's see where do we go from here. So then she starts figuring some things out. Yeah. As she uh, heads back home, blows up the mattress, sleeps on it again. She wakes up with it deflated. And Jason, St- Jason Statham, Jason Sudeikis and his buddy Joel answer the door or get in the door. And then they bring her in a... Uh, a bench. A futon. A futon. Very nice futon, by the way. And this is just all extra stuff that Jason Sudeikis has that he's inherited. So that uh, so he just has all this stuff. So that's kind of cool. So they see again the monster on the screen. And then kind of the same thing. She goes to the bar. She works. They see the attack on the screen in the bar, like projector. Hangs out again at night. Goes back to the park bench again, I believe repeats the same thing and that i don't know how many times it repeats i I can't remember how many but it's a certain point or three yeah after a certain point she has this realization when she sees the monster attack on the tv screen the next morning that it its movements look suspiciously familiar yeah and uh so she this time she goes to the she finds out that the monster attack is the same happens at the same time every night mm. um and so she goes uh to that she goes to back to the playground at the time that the monster attack is supposed to happen, which is 8.05 in the morning mm. for her locally. Of course, it's in South Korea, it's nighttime. Yeah. 
Um, but it's 8.05 in the morning for her locally. So at 8.05 in the morning, she goes back to the uh, playground and she does certain very, very specific movements. Mm. She makes her way back home. She uh, waits for the news report, sees the footage, and lo and behold, the monster is moving exactly the same way she did. Yeah. So my at this point in the movie, I'm like, okay, what, what's going on here? Is it like, is this her inner subconscious being portrayed as the colossal monster? Is um is she, is she uh is this her pain? Is this a, is this a normal thing that happens to women? Uh, I have all these questions, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so is this an analogy for alcoholism? But it doesn't matter. These questions don't matter because we get another ad spot at this point, Dave. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> I think it was uh, like a Geico or no State Farm ad. There's all sorts, all of, sorts ads. of weird. They were all terrible. Um, yeah, to to be, it's free. It's not bad. Just a lot of ads. Yeah, a lot of very, very terrible ads. Yeah, and so as we get through this, it people are reacting to this monster. They're seeing it on the news. Some are saying the world is ending. Some are saying like, oh, well, I guess, I guess it finally is happening. You know, it. it the people who are reacting at the bar, as well as like Jason Sudeikis' character and his friends, as well as like Anne Hathaway, it's very, very expected of how I would imagine people reacting to a monster attack. Like it's kind of like at this point in human history, if there was something to happen like this, the way they react in the movie is pretty accurate to real life. They'd be like, "Oh, okay, it's just happening." And, you know, there's fundraisers set up and all this kind of stuff you could donate, of course. But it's, like, pretty – it's as I, expect, I would expect. People wouldn't, like, lose their minds or anything. Maybe a few. But this is a small town in America, in the suburbs. So they're reacting how I would imagine. Probably how I would. I'd be like, oh, wow, that's crazy. And they keep scrolling. So anyway. So – Let's see, where do we go from here? This is how I'd imagine it. Yeah, and then Jason Sudeikis continues to be charming as heck. I keep mentioning that. There isn't much character. character uh, let's see. What did I write here? I'd say, there isn't much chemistry, but I think that's the point. I think I was writing about their relationship, like him and Anne Hathaway's. Um, and then I wrote down just what I thought. It's a good monster or something like that. And then it finally hits us. We're like, oh, it's her. Oh, and then another ad break. So at this point in the movie, I think this is where we she introduces the movements of the monster to the, the Jason Sudeikis and his friends. Yeah, so I'm basically sure. she invites Jason Sudeikis and his friends to the at, playground at 8.05 8 <laughs> a.m., <laughs> And it's kind of weird. Like they're like not they're they're just like not exactly. They're all hung over, so they're like, eh, sure, why not? And so they're not exactly paying attention very well. So it takes mm -hmm. a long time for them to process what's happening. Yeah. But she's like, you know, like you know, basically like. Like Tim yeah. Nelson has a tablet. Yeah. Yeah. And he's streaming it. Like, yeah. Bring out your tablet, go to the news website and just wait and watch what happens. And they're like, okay, what's happening? And they're like, oh yeah, the monster showed up. That's, and the monster, it shows the monster and it's like dancing on the screen. <laughs> and then you see Anne Hathaway dancing the same the way. Same and way. she's like, look at me. And it takes. And this is all happening on the playground next to that park bench. Yeah. So and she the, enters the playground and now she's the monster. And now she's the monster. And yeah, so basically they're like they're like watching this monster dance <laughs> and Anne Hathaway's like, "Now look at me. Look at me now." <laughs> and they're like, "Oh, okay." And they fi it finally clicks. It finally clicks. And they're like, "Oh, Pun shoot." Intended. Pun intended. Yeah, and uh <laughs> at some point um Something. So Jason Sudeikis is like, oh my god! Like he finally realizes what's going on. Yeah, and it's her who's the monster. And at some point, and he steps onto the playground, 
Well, well she falls. Yeah, that's and then right. He's like, oh shoot! And so he runs and helps her. Yeah, and that's then, right. And so then she that's gets right. knocked out or something. I don't remember. She just falls down. No, and, she trips. Oh, she trips. Yes, yeah, so she, she trips, trips and falls down. And Jason Jason Sudeikis runs onto the playground to help her up. And then they just don't think anything more of it, mm -hmm. and they go on about their day. But then when the news report comes out about it, mm -hmm. lo and behold, this giant robot has come in the picture um, along with the monster in South Korea. Mm. And uh, Jason Sudeikis realizes that, oh, that, if the monster is her, then the giant robot must be me. Mm. And this sort of, this is where the, this, so I think we should do like a spoiler here. Yeah, from here, spoilers yeah. for the rest of the film. Because this is where things start to break down. This is where the shift happens. Anne Hathaway is horrified that she's causing, you know. Destruction. Destruction. Yeah. And uh, Jason Sudeikis is kind of he's he's starting to realize he's excited oh. he's like this is kind of exciting like what what could what could we do with with this power you know mm -hmm. so from here it's basically like so she's i don't think she goes there that night she decides okay i'm not gonna go there this morning i'm gonna actually go home and so i think jason sudeikis gives her a ride or something and they drop her off and then the next day, she sees on the news the robot showed up, but not the monster. Yeah. And so Jason Sudeikis went out there with Tim Blake Nelson and his buddy Joel, and he's like, oh, look at me. I'm a robot. And he just started goofing off, walking around. Didn't kill anybody. Didn't destroy any buildings. Like, they made sure that was the case, but they wanted to test it out and see, oh, what's going on, you know? So then she gets upset at him about this. And then they're like, okay, well, let's figure this out. What could we do? I mean, what could you do? Because they think you're the mo you think you're the bad guy. So what could we do to fix this? And so they give her like this piece of paper. They write this message on here and they translate it to Korean. And so these are like, okay, so you're gonna. They figure out some way to. There's a dry spot wherever she, where she spawns. So in. basically, yeah. what happens is, um, so they figure out a message to send the people of mm. Korea. Yeah. Um, Jason Sudeikis gets somebody to translate it into Korean. Yeah, they go to the gas station, get it translated. Translate it to Korean and actually yeah. get it written out in big Korean letters on mm. a piece of paper. Yeah. And so at 8.05 the next morning, yeah. Anne Hathaway uh, walks gingerly out onto the playground, squats down gently, and begins to draw the Korean characters into the playground like material. Yeah. And she does that. And they made sure in the South Korea, when live streaming is going on, she's in like a, a sand bank or something or a Sandy beach. So that's, so she's writing her monster self is in the, on the beach writing this down. And basically the matches message says, I'm sorry. I don't want to hurt anybody. This was all a mistake or something. Yeah. To some extent. So after that, oh shit, I don't remember what happens after that. It's, I have written down here the confrontation scene, so I didn't write anything before that. So I think what happens after this is she catches, oh, they're all happy. They're all good. And then she goes back into her old habits and her old ways as Pastor, Ed, as Pastor Ed would say, she goes back to them old tapes and she flirts with her his friend Joel, the other actor, the other guy. And she flirts around with him. She flirted around with him the first day. And then she's like, oh, you know, you're real cute. I'll see you at your apartment later. So she meets his apartment. They hook up. They have a, they have a good night together. And then they wake up. And then she realizes... Oh, shoot. You know, it's like whatever time it is. But then she sees on the news that the robot's there again. And before she went to his apartment, Jason Sudeikis kind of noticed that she did leave for his apartment. So he knew, that he knew they were sleeping together or something. So she sees the robot on there. She gets all mad. She throws 
Joel's jacket at him. She's like, come on, let's go. And so he drives her, and they drive over to the playground. And Jason Sudeikis and Tim Blake Nelson are both really drunk. And Jason Sudeikis is, like, hopping around as the robot in the playground. And he's basically being a jerk. And he's like, you know, I get he's hurt, but it's like, come on, man, this is ridiculous. And he's kind of getting a little power hungry from all of this as we go through it. So that night is where this confrontation happens at the bar after hours. So they're hanging out like they usually do. And then Jason Sudeikis kind of switches things up. Like he's no longer the nice guy. Um, Let's see. What did I write here? Ads, ads, more ads at this point. Let's see. Man, she is nothing but trouble, man. She is an obvious cycle of bad habits and repeat mistakes and trauma. That is true. Um, However, she makes a mistake and triggers this to happen. But as we all know, even if we're responsible for our own actions, and Jay Sudeikis does not react correctly here. So in the scene that follows, Jay Sudeikis pretty much like belittles everybody in this friend group starting with Anne Hathaway. And he like breaks each person down by their weakest link. Tim Blake Nelson comes out of the bathroom. He's like, we know you're a junkie, blah. You're into, you know, all this crack and stuff. He's like, I'm not into dope. I'm not, I'm not into, uh, to, um, uh, white girl interrupted. I'm not into all this kind of stuff. So he calls him a junkie. Tim Blake Nelson gets really mad. He leaves. He then belittles Joel a lot. He belitt- continually belittles Anne Hathaway. He wants her to have a beer. He's just being a real a-hole, like complete and total ass. And I think what I wrote down is this. This is just my thoughts I was watching this scene because I didn't know what was going to happen later. So I wrote down, it says, I know this scene is with Sudeikis. Is suppo- he's supposed to be a jerk. But when others are around are acting like children, sometimes they deserve to be treated like children. But calling Till Nelson an a-hole is uncalled for. You can't treat, treat Jim Nelson like that. He's fine. Um, but I wrote down this. I said, this is an example of a man who's a, quote, nice guy, finally breaking and deciding to be an a-hole when he doesn't get his way for the umpteenth time. Because, through you know, he's supposed to be this nice guy who's done the right thing all of his life, but now he's finally got this opportunity. And then this opportunity with Anne Hathaway she kind of goes a different MR out and she goes back to her bad habits. And so I then continue saying, I'm not justifying his behavior, but I think it's interesting that Jason's character is finally deciding to break. To be fair enough, Anne Hathaway's character isn't making things easier. And then I wrote down ads. <laughs> <laughs> um, they sneak in an ED commercial. Oh yeah, we get an ED commercial. I forgot yeah. about that. <laughs> I oh, said I wrote man. down. I said it's almost 11 p.m. at night <laughs> right now. They gotta sneak an ED commercial in there somewhere. <laughs> so uh, that was interesting. Um, and then from there, I wrote down why is she running like that? Is this becoming interesting? This is becoming an interesting character turn for Sedakis. Um, man, what happens after this, David? I don't even remember. I think Dan Stevens comes into the fold. Yeah. I think he comes back and wants to yeah, check it Yeah, so on. he basically pretends to have a meeting in, like, a business meeting in her hometown. Yeah. Um, so he can come back and stage an intervention. Yeah. and Because he's worried about her, and even though he broke ties with her, he still checked in on her. Like, yeah. that was kind of nice. He, he, like, called her once. He video called her a second, another time. And at this point, you kind of get, like, oh, Dan Stevens kind of just wants her back because he might be lonely or he feels bad. Maybe he wants to mend things, but he kind of, he wants to check in on her. He wants to make sure she's okay. Yeah. You know? And he, uh, he sees this, um, unhealthy dynamic Mm -hmm. between Jason Sudeikis and Anne Hathaway. Yeah. And so he tries to intervene and, um, he tries to intervene and says, like, you know, come back to New York with me. Mm-hmm. It's like, we'll work things out. Just come back with me. Just leave this place. Yeah. But uh, at this point. Uh, and at this point, also, Jason Sudeikis is also like, I think, oh, OK, before this, she goes to his house, Jason Sudeikis' house, and it's like filled with stuff. 
it's like filled to the brim with all these different things that he's inherited from his parents and his family that he just has. So that's where all of the stuff has come from that he's given her. Like her house is basically furnished at this point. Like he's given her all this stuff to help her out. Uh, but anyway, I forgot about this. After the whole confrontation scene, she goes visits him that morning and he's hung over. He's drinking coffee in a robe. And it's kind of like this kind of reconciliation kind of scene where we get a little bit more backstory to him, what his perspective is. I mean, he's, he made a mistake. He says, sorry. But then we get Dan Stevens communicating to her and things kind of shift as well. So let's talk about the bar scene that proceeds after this. Oh, yeah. So we think, I'll set it up for you. So we think that Jason is on the mend. We think he's back in the fold. He's back to being his normal nice guy self, right? Dan Stevens then visits Anne Hathaway. She goes to his hotel. He's like, she's like, hey, just come to the bar with me. Just, I'll show you. I'll introduce you to everybody. And so she takes him back to the bar. He really doesn't want to go. He really wants to just take her back to New York. He wants to do the, the business trip or whatever he says as an excuse. Um, at this point, I kind of wrote down, Dan Stevens doesn't deserve her, but he cares for her, for her well-being. Um, and then I kind of wrote down halfway through the bar confrontation we're about to talk about, I wrote down, I've made up my mind, Dan Stevens is bad news. He needs to stop hanging out with Anne. He has this connection with her, but they don't complement each other. He seems to be upset at something more than just her being a waitress. But I think... No, that's that's not it. What's happened? Yeah, what's happened is what's happened is uh, Dan Stevens' character um, is realizing that Anne Hathaway mm. uh, is not doing anything with her life. Yeah, she's just straight a mess because mm. the whole idea was for her to go away and to actually work on herself. Mm. And but now it's kind of he realizes well, yeah. that this hasn't happened at all. Yeah. Um, she's just, uh, because you get the, she's like a writer, like a, like a writer of some yeah, like kind. Yeah, like a columnist or something. Yeah, and yeah. she's like, uh, quite successful. Hmm. And so basically Dan Stevens is like, you know, I want you to go away and get better hmm. so you can come back and, you know, come back to New York and start doing what you're good at. Yeah. Um, yeah living your life and being successful again. Yeah, he wants what's best for her. And but, that's probably the the best aspect of this. But so what, what he um so yeah, when he comes to her hometown and realizes that she hasn't gotten she hasn't any improved, help, got any help. She's just working at a waitress at a bar when she has a problem with alcohol. Mm-hmm. Um and he's just like, "Wait, this isn't this isn't good. You're mm. the you can do more with your life. Yeah. And so he ended up mm. she ended up convincing him to go to the bar and But before we get into the bar scene, I do want to mention that you kind of made me realize like this whole dynamic with Dan Stevens and what he wants for her and how I totally was looking at it at a negative like per- perspective. You were blinded by was, Jason <laughs> Sudeikis' charms. I was told, and I think that's what the goal of this movie was. All said and done, was oh, you want her to be with the nice guy that's charming. And they got good chemistry or whatever. But here's the thing: it's at a bar. She's an alcoholic. She she is giving into her negative traits, her negative aspects, her habitual stuff that she's carried over from college. You have her as somebody who will bring her mess with her wherever she goes. Yeah, and no the thing what. about the thing about this movie is now that we're clearly into spoiler territory, mm. um, like Jason Sudeikis was always the way he was. Yeah, um, like he was always a controlling a hole, mm. um, but he hid it well. And so yeah. the movie sort of disguises their relationship as like the uh, the normal like sort of like the hallmark the movie. precursor to a normal rom com movie relationship, mm. you know that where they're gonna hit some rocky patches, but they're gonna work everything out and it's gonna be all good. But what's actually happening is their relationship is extremely toxic, yes. and he's using her alcoholism in order to control her. 
Yeah, that's that's a good point. I never really thought of that because she's at the bar. She's with them every night, you know, hanging out and drinking a whole bunch. A mess in the morning, you know. It's just repeated. It's it's routine. It's just every negative thing that she has kind of attached herself to is being played and kind of fueled through this going back to her hometown. Through Jason Sudeikis, who's kind of like a warm blanket, takes care of her, but is using her for sure. Like, he's yeah, he's paying her to work at the bar to help out. But also, like, you know he has more intentions for that later on. He wants to get it with her. He wants to, he likes her, you know. He wants to get his way. Mm -hmm. And when he doesn't get his way, we see what happens. Yeah. So, and that kind of carries into the bar scene with him, Dan Stevens, and Anne Hathaway. So. Let's jump right into it. Let's jump right into it. So, David, uh, we get into the bar. There's a couple customers there. Dan Stevens and Anne Hathaway are in there. And it's in the morning. And it's so in the morning. The people so in there, they're like having breakfast and yeah. uh, drinking coffee. Drinking coffee, yeah. And then she introduces him to Jason Sudeikis, his character. And then from there, I believe the conversation goes into like their history together. Um, but before that, we get an ad spot. That's very important. Um, but then Jason Sudeikis starts going into like this monologue. It starts like threatening Dan Stevens. And at first you're like, oh, he's just being protective. But no, it's even more than that as you go through it. So, oh, shoot. What, what happens after that, David? He... Starts well, basically, of- basically, what happens is Dan Stevens is trying to make the case that um, she needs help so that she can go back to her life in New York and do what she's best at because she's like a celebrated columnist mm. um, who's like changing the world and accomplishing great things. And Dan Stevens wants her to get help mm. with her problems. So that she can go back to doing that, um, she can go back to doing that, and uh, sort of Jason Sudeikis uh, wanting to keep her tied, wanting to keep her tied down, sort of turns it back on him, and try you know sort of tries to twist everything that Dan Stevens is saying is like oh so you think waitressing isn't a worthwhile job and all that and you know dan stevens is not equipped for the kind of uh character that jason sudeikis is so he's like oh i'm sorry i didn't know i didn't mean that at all yeah. and then jason sudeikis is like no no of course and you know it feeds into this like rising offense and anger within him and he uh yeah he uh basically tells Dan Stephen that there's a whole host of irresponsible things that he could do at this bar. And he mentions a bunch of them. Mm. And then he gets to a point where it's like, it's not as irresponsible as the thing I'm about to do. And he finds this old firework from Mexico that him and his buddies picked up long, long time ago, never let off. He's like, this is the most irresponsible thing I could do. And he lights it off and it drives out all the customers and like sets the interior of the bar on fire in certain spots. And um, all of this is just to make a point. He's like, look at what I've done. I've acted like the biggest asshole I can possibly act like but she's still not going to go back to New York with you mm. because he's confident that he's got her under control. He's mm. got her under his thumb. And through all of this as well, he also has Joel, his buddy that she slept with. He has him under, he has him under his thumb as well. Like he has him uh, working for him and all this stuff. So he kind of like his whole friend group is all based off him controlling everything through it. Be the bar, access to alcohol, all this stuff. He has control over these people. Um, Tim Blake Nelson leaves and goes on his own way, and, which was smart. 
but Joel stays because there is more to get out of this and that's his friend. So he's taking advantage of the good naturedness of Joel, kind of like the same way Anne Hathaway took advantage of the good naturedness of Joel as well. So they run out of the bar. And I don't remember what happens with Dan Steven, but he gets separated from Anne. Well, basically what happens is he tells her that, okay, I'm going to leave at this time. Oh, that's right. Come with me. And uh, at first... And she actually um, considers it. Mm -hmm. So she's like, yeah, I'm, I should leave. I should go with him. But then Jason okay. Sudeikis comes in with the old one-two punch. Yep. And he basically blackmails her. Is like, if you go with him, I'm going to go to the playground at 8.05 in the morning and I'm going to stomp around and the robot's going to destroy, you know, destroy a lot of buildings and kill a lot of people because yeah. he knows exactly how horrified she is mm. that uh, she and that both of them are causing these giant monsters to appear when they walk through the playground at that certain time. And before this, at some point in the movie, I don't remember exactly when, but there was a point where I think it was when Jason Sudeikis and Tim Blake Nelson were at the playground and he was drunk. She like went onto the playground and slapped him. And on the, in South Korea, it was the monster slapping the robot. So there was like, it was like, Oh, there's tension between these two. They're not friends. Um, and then there was also a scene where, uh, shoot, I don't remember where I was going to go with this, but at this point, I believe it's when Jason, goes off to the playground and Anne Hathaway follows him. I believe so. And so he's now manipulating her and blackmailing her through this power they both have. As well, that's the other thing I just remembered, as well as there was a flashback scene, I believe around this time or a little before, where it showed a little girl carrying this like um, a science project with her, like a, not exploratory, what do they call those things? It's a... Um... It's a it's not a science project. It's like a it's a it's like a it's like a little cardboard thing cardboard, that she made. That's yeah. like it's basically like an artistic, like three dimensional artistic. They have a name representation for it. of yeah. uh, like South Korea because you see Korea, the South yeah. Korean flag on it and you see certain like buildings. elements and buildings. Yeah. So you have that flashback with the little girl holding that, as well as a boy walking next to her carrying his own thing. mm Hmm. And so you have Anne Hathaway following. Jason Sudeikis drives off over to the playground. Or she goes there that morning and he's there. And then this confrontation happens. So they get into this huge fight. He punches her, assaults her, and she tries to fight back. She can't. She can't overpower him. And then so she falls down on the ground. So in South Korea, the, the fight's happening in, between the robot and the monster. She's on the ground. And then we get from, the pers and this is so effective, you get from the, pers we know what's going on in South Korea, but we get the perspective in the small town, in the playground, they're fighting. You then have a, the camera on the ground showing in Hathaway behind Jason Sudeikis' feet. And what ensues is Jason Sudeikis does the most despicable thing he's probably done in this film up to this point, besides doing every bad thing that he's already done. He then proceeds to like, oh, you don't, you don't want like some about life and something about you don't, you get always get your way, but I never do or something like that. He's like, you think you can leave? Think again. And then, well, basically, he tells her that's like, um, he is he's clearly insecure. Yeah, that she went off to be a big shot writer mm -hmm. and he stayed tending bar in his hometown. Yeah, and so basically, he tells her. It's like, now I'm as important as you are, kind of a thing. And he's not going to let, he's not going to give this uh, newfound power up so easily. So, yeah, you have her on the ground after he's just punched her, watching his feet, watching him stomp, stomp, stomp. And you just see him stomping on the, 
the playground material, but you and in also the background, you hear, in the background you hear the screams of buildings being destroyed, people screaming. You know, clearly he's causing a lot of damage and killing a lot of people. Yeah. He then proceeds to stomp his way off of the playground, and she's just laying there totally, like, bewildered at this and hurt, of course. And then he runs off, drives away, and then she has to make a choice. Is she going to stay? Is she going to leave? What's she going to do? So then we proceed to, she buys, I don't know what happens next specifically, but then it hap- she goes to the airport. I believe so. She buys a ticket, and you think she's going to go with Dan Steven. So she's in a plane. She's going somewhere. She lands. She's on the phone. Dan Steven gives her a call. He's like, hey, where are you? I'm at the, um, at the airport. I'm going to pick you up or something. And she's like, well, I kind of took a detour. And he's like, what are you talking about? What, are you coming home or not? And then she's like, no, and I'll have to explain it to you later, but I, there's something I got to do first. And so he's like, what? And so at this point I wrote down communication woman, like, come on, tell him, like, if you like this, if you love this man, like then then do it. But we all in due time. I get it. Well, I don't know if, I don't know. if It was uh, the right time for everything. It might not have been. I don't, yeah, I don't think the movie at all implies. I don't think he needs to know about it. Well, I don't think that the movie at all implies that Dan Stevens and, um, Anne Hathaway get together. No, no. I think just because of like the kind of movie it is and the climate in which it was made, it's, you know, it's very, it's a good movie. Yeah. But at this point in the, mm. at this point in the film, it's, it's all about that wham and empowerment. Yeah. I got a little bit of that at the end as well. When we so were watching this. She, so basically, uh, she like tells him off on the phone Yeah, as if he's like, if it's, if it's it's his fault. Uh, yeah, as if he's doing something wrong, even though she agreed to meet him, and he's been trying to help her this whole time. And she's like, no, screw you. I don't know you an explanation, and hangs up. Because, yeah. you know, she's got to be the empowered woman. Uh-huh. So that, that what I say, is the, uh, the major uh, yeah. flaw of this part that, of the movie yeah. is it gets in a little bit of that... Of uh, that- that feminist the little, the little stuff that had to be sprinkled through the script to get a green lit, basically. Yeah. Kind of like, this is a terrible example. Well, this is a good example. But a more recent example is, you know the movie Monkey Man that came out, David? I've remember, heard of it, yeah. I remember, I don't know if uh, you remember, but I told you, I went to go see it. It was like a John Wick style film set in India. And it was really cool. Dave Patel directed and is the main guy and wrote part of and wrote it as well. However... This is an original film, right? So how do you get stuff greenlit in Hollywood that's original like this? You add stuff like, well, back in 2016, it would be the feministy kind of things. But now it's more like uh, part of the message, you know? So, they ha- so in the movie, uh, no spoilers, by the way. I'm not going to spoil the movie. But there's a port- part of this film, Monkey Man, where he is resting at this temple that is being is a refuge for transgender people in India. And these transgender uh, women are helping him back to health. And they become a major part of the final act of the film. <laughs> and it's very out of nowhere, very random, makes really not a whole lot of sense. Um, and just kind of really took me out of the movie when I went to go see it. So I- I'd recommend Monkey Man, but like, only for the action and stuff like that, with one very precarious element that was obviously put in there, whether it be for social justice reasons or good reasons in general, good meaning, regardless, it was absolutely put in there as an element to get a script greenlit. And that's the unfortunate reality of Hollywood today. However, this is original film Colossal, has much more interesting elements, and I feel like that little feministy thing at the end yeah, it's in there, and definitely it's in there to check a box. But unfortunately, it takes away from her character, I feel, in the end. Yeah, and it's a minor thing. It's a minor thing. Because the ending is still cool, Yeah, but it's just more like the way, like, like the, the one... The way it was conveyed was weird. Like, the way she treats the one person yeah. who's actually trying to help her mm-hmm. this whole time, and they, like, sort of treat 
him trying to help her as just another one of her toxic relationships that she's got to be free of. When in reality, as we've already been established in this film, Dan Stevens actually cares for her, has checked in on her multiple times, went out there to her, spent money to make sure she's okay, try to take out of this toxic situation that she wasn't realizing what was going on, which also is kind of cool because I didn't realize it was going on either until we're kind of having this retrospective right now. So overall, this movie, pretty well written, well done. It's just there's a couple minor elements that kind yeah. of take you out of it. And this is at the end. So let's get into the end. What happens, Dave? What happens after she blows off Dan Steven and just says, get out of my life. I'm well, a, I'm basically, a, you know. she uh, she gets off the plane. She walks out and turns out she's in <gasps> South Korea. What? She is in the city of Seoul. No way. Um, and uh, she walks out to the place where the monster attacks happen. Mm, but who's there first? Um, and so, yeah, so before... Oh, well, yeah, we'll get into it later. Yeah, yeah. so yeah. before she walks out to the place where the monster attacks happen, yeah. um, uh, Jason Sudeikis is in the playground waiting to step onto the actual playground part of it at 8.05 and, you know launch the giant robot attack mm -hmm. uh, because she, uh, you know, she basically, uh, you know, disrespected him. And, uh, well, he also feels like he this is narcissist. Yeah. Basically you know? he's, he's a total narcissist, total narcissist and he's like totally upset. He does this in the morning. He goes to work. He sees it on the news. He's like, <laughs> I did that, you know? Yeah. And so he's like, totally upset that she managed to get free of his grasp. And so he's going to have, uh, he's going to take it out on the people of soul. Mm -hmm. So he's waiting in the wings to do this. And at around the same time, she's walking out to the place where the monster attacks happen in soul. Yeah. And basically what happens is, um, eight Oh five in the little town, happens he steps out onto the playground but then he looks and as he's doing that she's walking to the place where the giant robots appearing in the sky and then lo and behold it switches back to his perspective in the playground and he hears a shong, shong, and you see shong. the giant monster has actually appeared <laughs> in their hometown walking towards him yep and Oh my god, it's so dope. The way they set this up, the way it's like conveyed. They do have a weird flashback uh, back to the little girl and boy, which we find out as spoilers, Jason Sudeikis and Anne Hathaway, those little kids in elementary school. And, and this is where it all started. This is where it's all started. There's like a lightning storm. Her little like her little cardboard her little thing that she kind made. kind of thing flies away onto this property as they're walking by it, which turns out to be the playground in the past. But before, but before it, was it was just an undeveloped... Playground. Yeah, undeveloped piece of... Fenced off piece of land. Yeah, land. So Jason Sudeikis goes across, climbs over the fence, tries to get it for her. She follows him. She climbs down a tree. Whoa! The lightning strike hits the tree and hits her and then hits Jason Sudeikis. And uh, for some reason, 25 years ago... There was a monster in Seoul, and it was her at some point. Somehow this happened, and that's their explanation. It's kind of silly, but back to the ending. It's so cool the way that it's handled. Like she comes in, and he's freaking out, and he's like, it's like it's so cathartic and like rewarding. And it's just, it's so great. Uh, my whole notes are like, oh my God, what's happening? This is really interesting. Oh my God, dude, this is dope. Um, so she finally goes in. You're like, what's, what's he going to, what's she going to do to him? What's going to happen? She then in Seoul reaches down in the ground as the robot is running away from her into the ocean. She reaches down and grabs a hold of where she thinks she's Sudeikis is. And she's correct. She grabs him. She's lifting him into the air. 
and she's looking at him, and in Sewell, the robot's being lifted into the air, and he's in the air. And he's like, let go of me, you bitch. Like, he's, like, really mad, and he's, like, scared out of his wits. He's going to poop his pants. And you're like, is, he gonna, is she going to eat her, him? Like, what's going to happen? She just chucks him and throws him, like, a 100 miles, and he absolutely doesn't make it. So he, she murders him <laughs> and gets rid of him. Um, so she murdered that boy. And then my last notes of this movie, David, is I don't know if I, I don't know if I like it, <laughs> but I think after talking about this tonight, I, I very much do like this film. Um, but anyway, like, what did your, what are your thoughts in the end? Like, what did you think of this, this ending, this ending confrontation and how it was handled? Yeah, it was definitely a satisfying ending. Yeah, the whole "I am woman, hear me roar" part was a little much. <laughs> but other and then than Katy Perry starts playing in the background. But other than that, this was a. Uh, I think this was a satisfying ending. Um, it's not a terribly. It's not like a. They don't unexpe- drop the ball at all. And it's not like an yeah. unexpected twist, but it's also not the ending you'd necessarily expect to happen. Mm. It's just kind of like, whoa, this is, whoa, what, whoa, what's going yeah, on here? Yeah, you're like, whoa, okay, what's happening? And, uh, yeah, it's very satisfying. The uh, Jason Sudeikis, the controlling narcissistic asshole, gets what's coming to him, mm. and uh, the city of uh, the city of soul is saved. And yeah. And they don't even see the monster anymore. They're like, what's happening, you know? Yeah. So it's kind of interesting too how like um, you see the perspective from Jason Sudeikis in their hometown. He's being grabbed by the monster and thrown off into the horizon where he clearly, you know, dies on impact wherever he lands. And then it cuts to the city of Seoul. And Anne Hathaway's perspective, where she's like throwing air, and the robot is off in the distance, like being suspended in the air, and then yeeted out into the sea, where probably into China, probably just like into the ocean, basically, just like it's so. It was well earned, and you know what? I just thought of this. If this was a more feministy kind of movement, especially in 2016, I mean, 2016, David, is the year we got the Ghostbusters reboot, just to remind you. So it was a very much, this is what Hollywood is heading toward. Um, so with scripts and all that kind of stuff. So it's really cool that this movie handled Jason Sudeikis' character really well because that was something that could have been bad, that could have been messed up real easily, especially in the writing. But I was really proud of this film because it earns it and it handles it really well. And Jason Sudeikis' character, his acting is so well done in this that it just translates incredibly well. Like, he's a great actor. He reminds me of, um, shoot, I don't remember the, uh, oh, Ed Helms in the movie Chappaquiddick with um, Clark, uh, I can't remember who plays Ted Kennedy in it, but it's uh, there's a movie called Chappaquiddick. Um, I can't remember who plays Ted Kennedy. I know the name. I can't remember the name, but I know the actor. But anyway, it's a really great film about the whole Ted Kennedy situation and, you know, the drowning of the lady, the car accident, all that kind of stuff. And Ed Helms plays his, like, his friend in that movie. And Ed Helms just delivers, like, an Oscar-worthy performance that is so great in that film. Um, And that kind of reminded me of this performance, a normal comedic actor into this more serious kind of role where he opens up, Jason Sudeikis opens up as a character that, oh, wow, you know, he's really charming. He's really cool. But he has character development. This stuff happens to him, and he just makes all the bad, all the wrong decisions. So the main point is this script, the way the character is written, could have been messed up really easily, but they didn't. So I think they did a good job in that aspect. So yeah, I would have to agree. Yeah, this this movie is definitely worth watching. Um, it's different. It's a different kind of recommendation than Click. 
with click <laughs> it's like you just got to experience this whether you want to watch it again after you experience it <laughs> I thought it, you were going to say whether you want to or not <laughs> no like, you got to experience this and whether you want to watch it again after you experience it is going to be up to you mm-hmm. but i feel like this is a different kind of recommendation oh, yeah. this is this is a movie that is a uh, there's not like a whole lot of depth to it, mm. but it's just it's really interesting. It's really interesting and it's really well done. Yeah. So I would definitely recommend it just just for that because even though it's a pretty low budget movie, it's done very well and there's not any movie like it. Yeah, that that's another thing too. There's not really a film I think that I can think of that's like this one. And Colossal, I think, really just stands out among kind of a lot of just films that flew under the radar. And this is definitely, I would say, I would rank it as a hidden gem. That's what I would say. Like Click, everybody knows Click. Colossal, we had no idea what we were getting into. And like it opens up in South Korea, and we're like, why is it in Japan? (laughs) (laughs) And then we go along, we're like, what is going on here? And then... As the movie unfolds, too, it explains it in a really good way. Everything unfolds in the correct order. And the character dynamics and the change and shift in the movie is also really poignant, is what I would say. Yeah, and it's a really seamless transition, too. Oh, dude, so seamless. Because you have Jason Sudeikis starts off as like, you know, the country boy protagonist of a Hallmark movie, and he's like a controlling asshole at the end. Yeah. And it's like the transition isn't, there's not a clear delineation where it really happens per se, Mm. but it's just kind of a smooth transition. And then you just get to a point where like, oh, he was always a controlling asshole. Yeah. Like I want to go back now and kind of just give it another rewatch. We meet with maybe with somebody who hasn't seen it before and just, on a second viewing for me, it'd be really cool to not only see the reaction, but to kind of analyze Jason Zudekis' character and see what's going on behind his brain. Because I know he's, I know for sure he's that good of an actor too. Like he can definitely pull that off. So I'm really curious to see on a second viewing his behavior, his eye movements, what he's thinking, that kind of thing. So, Colossal, if you've gotten this far, we've spoiled it for you. But I'd suggest watching it very good film two thumbs up i would recommend it highly recommend it so oh maybe not highly but i'd recommend it it's a good movie yeah it's a good movie it's not bad so it's uh it's not gonna like live in the annals of (laughs) the greatest films of all time by any means like it's um, definitely worth it Worth a watch. It's not like uh, it's it's not a Shutter Island. No, it, we're we're not coming away from this uh, from this two films episode with a stellar gem of a film that <laughs> is going to live on as one of the greatest films ever made. Yeah. Uh, but at the same time, this is definitely a good movie, and it's worth watching. Yeah, and I um, it's kind of what we came. It's different also from Stay our prior episode where we had stay in Shutter Island because stays like people have called it a hidden gem. I wouldn't say stay is a hidden gem. It's just a hidden, interesting work of art is what I would say. It's a good movie, but it's not, it's very, like you said, it's very hostile to the viewer. It's very, uh, it takes work to experience it to its, to its nth degree. Colossal is nothing like that. It's definitely a film that unfolds like a normal film would, and it's really well handled. So, Colossal, recommend. Click, not so much. But it's something that you probably should experience anyway. You should watch it at some point. At some point in your life. It took me my whole life at this point to stay away from Click until this moment. And then and I finally had experience it. And now I'm never going to watch it again. Yeah, whether Maybe you... Maybe with my wife in the future, but never again. Yeah, I'll do click... it for you, honey, just so you know. <laughs> But that's about it. I won't do it for anybody else. Click is one of those movies that basically it's like the only reason that I want to watch it at any point is to show people who haven't experienced it yet because it's just, <laughs> it's a ride, man. It's a ride, man. Yeah. Oh, it's super f- just random tangent. Uh, one of my 
coworker is Garrett. Shout out to Garrett, by the way. If he, I don't know if he's listening to this, but shout out to you, Garrett. He showed me. <laughs> showed me a video that he took where he was at this house party in downtown Chico, right? And so they're having a good time, all these Gen Z kids or whatever. And then one guy's like, yo, let's put on The Dark Knight. It's on Netflix. And so they put on The Dark or on HBO or whatever. And so they put on The Dark Knight and literally all the Gen Z kids like cumulated to the living room and sat down and all watched The Dark Knight, the whole movie. And he showed me a video of it. And it's like, they're all like, they're like, yeah, it's the Joker. Oh my God, it's The Dark Knight. So I just, I just thought it was so funny like all these kids are like so enraptured by christopher nolan's brilliance you know and jonathan nolan so i just thought wow those kids you know, they're at this party but they got some class man they know they know goodness when they see it so anyway shout out to you garrett you're awesome uh and with that uh i don't know uh what else to say i think we covered both of them extensively and yeah. i can't wait for our oh, david i can't wait for our next pairing i am I am so excited. I can't, I'm not going to say it right now, but you will see. You will see, ladies and gentlemen, what our next two films are. I, it's going to be something. Oh boy. Oh it boy. will be something for yeah. sure. So thank you so much again for listening to another episode of the Snarp Fangle podcast. We appreciate your time, consideration, and uh, listening ears. And if you have any inquiries or funny stories you want to send us, send us to snarpfanglepod at gmail.com. We're going to still do that, and we'll eventually do an episode where we take your listener inquiries and uh, talk about them and inquire what you have to say. So again, snarpfanglepod at gmail.com. Send us over there. I should probably should have said at the beginning of the episode, but if you've gotten this far, you're a real true trooper. So You're the deserving chosen few if you've gotten this far. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and with that, thank you, ladies and gentlemen, and... Snarpfangle on. Bye-bye now.